murdered in hate crimes countrywide in the last three months alone. China Gibson was killed on February 25th in New Orleans. Jamie Lee wounded arrow killed on January 1st in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Misha Caldwell killed on January 4th in Canton, Mississippi. But today is also a day for being counted, for becoming visible to the world, and for fighting injustice in an unfriendly political climate. Recently, we learned that Donald Trump eliminated sexual orientation identity from the 2020 census, denying us the funding for critical support services. I uh, identify as a transgender man. My pronouns are he, him, his, and that's how I like to be recognized. This is not a day of mourning. This is a day of visibility. This is a day of recognition. This is a day of empowerment. These activists are part of LA's Transgender Advisory Council, one of the first permanent transgender councils in the country. And they advise city leaders on HIV and health care, job and housing discrimination, and other issues that affect the transgender community. The primary scary experience that I have faced has not been one of violence, but one where I have not been protected on my job. And so when a corporation found out that I was a trans woman, I was instantly terminated. Oftentimes, we are left out of the conversation and we are not at the table when decisions are being made on our behalf. These things all add to almost erasing our humanity. I hope this night will, nightmare will be over soon and we can all achieve our constitutional and God-given right for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Thank you. For these activists, those rights have to start with speaking your truth. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The Trans Day of Visibility is honored in countries around the world. Well, for many of us, the weekend may be a time for some R&R, &R, but not for one community. Hyde Park residents and fellow Angelinos came out to get their hands dirty for a clean cause. Rasha Goel has more. Rakes, brooms, shovels, and some helping hands were all on board to help clean up the Hyde Park neighborhood. We will be going up and down Hyde Park Boulevard between 11th Avenue and Van Nuys Avenue, um, cleaning up all of the weeds, bulky items, trash, uh, any issues that we have on the railroad tracks. It's an area the district has received a lot of complaints about. In addition to beautifying the area, it's also a chance to interact with neighbors. What we're trying to do is give, up, give people an opportunity to meet each other, to work shoulder to shoulder, uh, to get to see your neighborhood. It's very different than driving through your neighborhood than it is walking block to block. Various community groups also came out to help. It's something that we have to do as a community, uh, try to make our city as beautiful as possible with the help of the, the youth. No job at this cleanup is too small. Little by little, but large enough to make an impact. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Think it's too late to earn a high school diploma? Well, think again. The LA City Library offers free accredited classes online for working adults. Gil Reyes has more from a different kind of graduation ceremony. She finally did it. After dropping out of high school years ago, Valeria Siriani took advantage of a second chance and finally earned her high school diploma. It was something really amazing. It was like a whole new experience. Congratulations go out to 30 unique graduating students. Their ages range between 20 and 55. The latest to graduate from the LA City Library's career online high school program. It allows people who, for some reason or another, didn't finish traditional high school to finally earn their diplomas at their own time. And oftentimes in between work. Take the case of class valedictorian and library employee Samson Rodriguez feeling out of place in traditional high school after immigrating from Mexico, he too had dropped out years ago. There was a lot of pressure and there was humiliation too when I would get called out or bullied um, at a young age for not knowing certain simple things. So I like Career Online High School because it was simple, I did it from home. Graduate Claudine Verdier discovered her high school credits in her native Belize could not transfer over to the U.S. So she too enrolled in the program 
and is now trying to convince her son, a dropout, to do the same. I just say, I'm just going to do the whole high school over. And I showed him I could do it, you could do it. The L.A. City Library is the first library system in the nation to offer these courses. It's an incredible program and a great example of how the library really changes lives. These individuals now with their high school diploma are uh, able to get better jobs and uh, more opportunities in higher education. So I'm currently in school. I'm getting my bachelor's and I'm going to be going to chiropractic school too as soon as I'm done. Nice. I go to Pasadena City College. Yeah, I'm working for my associates for nursing. If you think you're scared uh, or you think it's too hard or you think it's not right for you, just do it. I mean, what do you have to lose? Nothing, of course, because online classes are free. At Career Online High School Graduation, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Interested in enrolling? Well, check out the website lapl.org slash cohs. Well, it's a reminder of the lessons learned from the Rodney King riots. 25 years later, art helps us to give us perspective as the reimagined justice exhibit opens in South L.A. Night begins to fall and the intersection is burning. Another man who was beaten staggers up as a black preacher seems to pray over him. The Rodney King riots marked their 25th anniversary this month, and the Office of Community Coalition, a social justice group formed after the riots, has turned its entire office into a living art exhibit for the month. It sits less than a mile from where the riots started in South L.A. The reimagined justice exhibit focuses on the civil unrest and looting, which started after LAPD officers were found not guilty in the beating of Rodney King. The riots then spread to other parts of the city. It really marks a time for us to uh, take a moment to pause uh, and really think about and reflect around uh, you know, what has really changed uh, 25, year, uh, 25 years later. Learn about uh, the roots that led up to the civil unrest. Uh, also talk about uh, what are some of the conditions that folks are facing today. Photographs, art, live performances and media all give a glimpse into different people's experiences of the riots. Over 50 artists and their teams are taking part and many of them are from South L.A. It was really powerful in putting this show together, how many people came uh, who brought their personal artifacts, people's original photographs that have never been seen before. Among those never before seen photos is the work of photographer Abraham Torres. That night, I, we didn't realize that we're driving into the riot. The riot had begun that night. These pictures are incredibly rare. The future of our city really depends on how much progress we can bring to communities like South Los Angeles that have a history of neglect and disinvestment. There's a way of being cathartic about the experience because everybody who was in L.A. during that time knows exactly where they were during the riots and has a story to tell. And the exhibits allow plenty of room for both catharsis and reflection on how we can bring progress to a long impoverished area. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. For more information, visit CocoSouthLA.org forward slash L.A. Uprising. Police and firefighters shave it all off to raise money for cancer research. Gil Reyes shows us what all the buzz is about on St. Baldrick's Day. A nice full head of hair on both L.A. City Fire Captain Danny Wu and LAPD Lieutenant Greg Doyle, but not for long. And it's all for a good cause. 15 years ago, when my son had cancer, I started to, I joined up with the fire department. Uh, the captain at this station was doing an event, and, uh, and he let me join in very graciously. And ever since then, it's taken off. So over the years, we've raised over a million dollars for the St. Baldrick's Foundation. The yearly St. Baldrick's Day event at North Hollywood Fire Station raises money for child cancer research. People shave their heads in solidarity, a show of support for loved ones who bravely endured pain and loss of hair from chemotherapy. Maggie Ownby lost a family member to cancer in February. I did this for Eileen and her memory and her loving memory, and I'm doing it also for the honored kids. I met a wonderful kid today named Angel, and it just touched my heart so much. This year our goal is $100,000, and we're pretty confident we're going to reach that. But uh, just to be sure, I encouraged everybody to get out, out here this morning and to help us uh, reach our goal. 
Every three minutes around the world, a child is diagnosed with cancer. People gladly losing their locks in hopes of one day finding a cure. In North Hollywood, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Officials at the fire department say they surpassed their $100,000 fundraising goal. Well, plenty of hair was also being cut over at a Woodland Hill school as kids cut their ponytails for cancer victims. Anna Marcos has more from the annual Pony Up Cutathon. Lots and lots of ponytails everywhere. There's blonde ones, long ones, there's twin ponytails, multiple ponytails, and more, as dozens of students, even parents and teachers, prep their hair for the fourth annual Pony Up Cutathon. I'm going to miss it like uh, probably like for the first minute and then I'll probably get over it. I'm cutting my hair. I want to give them to the person who don't have any hair. One of my um, family members has cancer and they're fighting it right now. So I feel bad. Well, I want um, them to feel happy that they don't feel out like they don't have hair. So I want to give them my hair so they feel happy. The cutathon at Serenia Charter Elementary School in Woodland Hills helps collect hair for cancer survivors who have lost their hair after going through chemotherapy. Yvette Peterson, a two-time cancer survivor, started the event. When you look into the mirror and see yourself bald, it's such a, such a significant reminder that you're sick and you don't feel whole. What's really powerful about that is not just the hair that people are cutting off so it can be made into a wig, but that tremendous act of kindness. A snip of the scissors and there they go, donating anywhere from eight inches to a foot of their hair. It takes hair from about six volunteers to make a wig. I feel so good. Well, I thought about it, but I wasn't quite brave enough to cut my hair. However, I am lending support with a little pony up beanie. Oh my, there's even some styling going on. Now I really wish I would have done it. This little boy did. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. By the way, you can cut your hair and donate it to the cause anytime. To find out how, visit Pantene.com and click on the link Beautiful Lengths. A Dudley intersection in West Hills gets a safety upgrade. Councilmember Mitch Englander kicks off his film festival for young filmmakers. And kids in West LA have a new place to play. All these stories in City Beat. Councilmember Mitchell Englander joined Los Angeles Department of Transportation and community members to activate a pedestrian warning device at the Jason and Roscoe intersection in West Hills. The project's undertaking comes after a mother, her daughter and their family dog were struck and killed while crossing the street in the marked but uncontrolled crosswalk. Officials say the Jason and Roscoe pedestrian warning device project combines two overhead flashing beacons with pedestrian controls and in-road flashing LEDs to vastly improve visibility of those crossing the intersection, especially at night. Englander also kicked off his second annual Movies That Matter Youth Short Film Festival, which is open to young filmmakers from elementary, middle, high school, and college campuses throughout Council District 12 and the San Fernando Valley. Participants will be using the themes of social action and civic engagement to channel their creative process in one of four categories, public service announcement, documentary, live action, and animation. For more information or to submit, visit cd12movies.com. The Department of Recreation and Parks, along with Councilmember Paul Koretz, celebrated the reopening of the playground at Cheviot Hills Recreation Center, located in West L.A. Cheviot Hills Park serves nearly 6,000 residents who are within walking distance. The newly installed playground was designed with a treehouse-themed play area featuring a hollowed-out sycamore tree piece with multiple stumps that children can play on. The play equipment includes two bays of swings, two belts, and two tot seats and a tire swing. For more fun, you know, more up-to-date, uh, and I think uh, this will be a great place for kids. Well, you probably think you've seen all there is to see in L.A., right? Well, you'd be wrong. A new experience is highlighting some of L.A.'s hidden gems while making the old look new again. Rasha Goel has more as the Center Theatre Group recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. 
It's an opportunity to explore the sights and sounds of downtown L.A. Remote L.A., put on by the Center Theatre Group, is celebrating its 50th season at the Mark Taper Forum. This walking performance tour gives people a unique way to learn about themselves, people around them, and the city. You walk next to others, but how close do you want them to be? How close do you want to be to your neighbor? Remote LA isn't your average tour. Through a computer-generated recording, you are guided through the city in real time, and not just as a spectator, but also as a participant. The performance reveals an unseen L.A., places where people explore their limits and see common places. It's a creative way of seeing the city while understanding how you perceive things. I thought it might be a great way to see places that I don't usually have access to in the city and to do so with other people, meet new people, interact with them, and new spaces at the same time. I know L.A. fairly well, and I've lived in the area for a long time, but it just seemed a, a really unusual way to encounter downtown. From the inside of Union Station to the outside of Pershing Square, visitors are able to capture the historic sites of downtown LA without a detailed narrative. Downstairs walk along the platform. Don't enter any train before I tell you to do so. I feel like everyone kind of has an idea of what LA is, so maybe this will give like a new perspective. A new way of seeing an old city. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Center Theatre Group is one of LA's leading nonprofit theater companies. Well, if you love modern art, you may want to check out the new exhibit at Art and Practice. Enjoy an Earth Day celebration that's perfect for the whole family, and some seniors go all out for a talent show in Sherman Oaks. All this in this week's Things to Do. Art in Practice presents a solo exhibition of artworks by artist Al Loving. For 40 years, Loving experimented with materials and process to expand the definition of modern painting, drawing on everything from free jazz to his family's quilting tradition. In the 1980s, Loving broke free of that flat image, using heavy rag paper to make three-dimensional collages in brilliant colors. At AMP, Spiral Play will feature 12 of these collages, some of them monumental in scale. The work is radical, beautiful, and deeply human. His work will be on display at Art and Practice at 3401 West 43rd Place in Lamert Park from April 22nd through July 29th. To learn more, visit artandpractice.org. Join L.A. Sanitation for the annual Citywide L.A. Sanitation Earth Day L.A. 2017 Festival. There will be over 50 exhibits dedicated to promoting sustainability and environmentally friendly activities, including city vehicles to explore, seed planting, and mulch giveaways. Entertainment will also be on hand, including performances from Tommy the Clown and other musical acts. The event takes place Saturday, April 22nd at Exposition Park, South Lawn, near the Metro Expo Line. For more, visit LACitySan.org. Unleash your artistic talents during the Spring 2017 Senior Amateur Talent Show. Join the fun or just come watch a variety of individual and group performances of singing, dancing, spoken word, and comedy. If you've ever wanted to show off your talents, this is the perfect opportunity. Admission is free and all ages are welcome. It all takes place at the Sherman Oaks East Valley Adult Center at 5056 Van Nuys Boulevard. For more information, call 818-386-9674. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.
Christy Oldham in Los Feliz. You're watching LA City View, channel 35. Our city, our channel. Would you like a mustache with that?
Good morning, good morning. Today is Friday, April 21st. We are so happy to be in the warm valley with warm people. Uh, we do not have a quorum as of yet, but I think we can begin today's uh, uh, council meeting with our presentations. And I'd like to call on Mitchell Englander to start it off. So uh, those of you that uh, need a seat, if there's a seat, find one. Mitch, the floor is yours. All right. Come on up, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the wrong Mitch. <laughs> but, but he's up there. I'm up here. All right. See, I... Oh, you wanted the good Mitch. I wanted, I wanted the good Mitch, but oh, I'll yeah. take, you got, you I will gotta take say you. That. You got it. You got it. Mitch O'Farrell. I'm sorry. Yeah, come on, come on in tight, guys. Left and right, all the way out. Well, I, I think you made the wise decision in having me go first. Look at the army I have behind me. So let me just tell you. Let's give these good-looking guys yeah, a round right, of applause. applause. Welcome. So, so this is so cool. This presentation is, and, and before I start talking about these guys, let me give you a little bit of the history of the magic of the, the, the seed that grew into these incredible athletes. Uh, first, this school, Sierra Canyon School, was a camp, and it was very, very well known as the top camp to send your kids to in the San Fernando Valley. Started by uh, two gentlemen that really did an incredible job, Howard and Mick, for many years. And because the families loved them so much in this campus, it bloomed into a school, an elementary school, for many, many years. Because of their success in elementary, they decided to build a high school. And with that vision and that dream, an athletics program, but before that, they wanted to focus on academics. And academic and academia at Sierra Canyon is unparalleled. They became a blue ribbon school at an early age, uh, made it to the top list of the governor's top schools in the state of California, and they've excelled and achieved ever since. So then they built this incredible high school, but that wasn't enough. And there was true visionaries and leaders that came in and said, we have to build. We've already got the great elementary school. We've got the high school. Now we've got an athletics program, the best academia. Now we need the best football team in the state of California, and they have achieved that, and they're here today. Let's give them a round of applause. Today we welcome the Sierra Canyon School football team, and Coach Jonathan Ellinghouse, our team captains, uh, Ray, Captain Cole, Harris, and Tate, uh, they're the trailblazers, and that's their mascot, rightfully named. The third year, of the CIF Southern California Section Champions, the second year in California State Champions, and they recently moved up their division where they fought harder and succeeded. This year, Sierra Canyon School won the CIF Division II Eight State Champions Final. So let's give them a huge round of applause. They, uh, they held off the Sierra Padres at 42 to 40. And during the game, Bobby Cole rushed for 220 yards and four touchdowns with 30 carries. Let's give him a huge round of applause. Oh. Kane and Ray helped anchor the team's potent offensive line at right tackle and will be going to UCLA. So let's give him a big round of applause. Staying local. We we'll better warn USC about them. <laughs> Athletic plays an extremely important role in our youth's academic career. And it teaches them not just about winning and losing, but teamwork and perseverance, leadership skills, sportsmanship. And these are the gentlemen that reflect all of those true abilities. You know, the only place success comes before work is in the dictionary, as Vince Lombardi said. And these young athlete, athletes, uh, have worked diligently in both athletics and academics throughout the season. So I'd like to now introduce to you our coach, John Ellinghouse, to say a few words. Come on. Up. 
Well, first, I'd just like to say it's a huge honor to be here. We're, we're so appreciative of, uh, of being recognized. It really was a magical year with some really special kids. And uh, to go 16-0 and, and uh, you know, not necessarily have the biggest roster every time we played, but had kids with the biggest heart. And uh, you know, I'm so glad that you guys chose to recognize these young men because they really are truly special. Um, I would also like to take a moment uh, to thank uh, Councilman Mitchell Englander. Uh, he has been incredibly supportive of Sierra Canyon, and I know uh, myself and all of my bosses are so appreciative of everything you've done to help the school. And uh, this is just another another uh, way of helping us by recognizing us here today. So, thank you so much. We're honored to be here. I would like to uh, present you oh, very cool. this is awesome. with a uh, with a jersey with our year that we won it. All right, they got a new water boy. <laughs> all right, this is awesome. <laughs> And I'd like to present the team as well with a uh, certificate of appreciation, a resolution, and saying congratulations to Sierra Canyon School, to the football team, to all of you. And let's hear it again for the champions right here. Congratulations. Um, next, week, next week, we'll be putting an official city street sign that'll be there forever in perpetuity uh, to commemorate this incredible championship. And why that's important is for many things, not just to show it off to all the future football players that come onto campus, but for each one of you to bring your children by and say, this is something we did, not just to make the school proud, not just to make our parents and the team proud, but the entire city of Los Angeles is proud and will always be. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Let's give these champions a round of applause. Good luck in the future, guys. Now, as they're leaving, I'd like to call on Mr. Mitch O'Farrell. And when they, when this group clears out, the floor will be Mitch O'Farrell's. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. As our state champion team makes its way out, we have uh, another team making its way in, and that is our uh, volunteer corps for the Los Angeles Public Library System on Volunteer Appreciation Day. All right, let's give them a round of applause. Well, I have the great pleasure of chairing the Arts, Parks, and River Committee and the Los Angeles Public Library. Uh, we deal with issues in the library system on that committee, and I am pleased to be surrounded by our city librarian, John Zabo, and just a few of the many generous volunteers who day in and day out assist in our libraries. We are so fortunate to have one of the nation's greatest library systems with Central Library, of course, the iconic Central Library, and 72 branches throughout the city of Los Angeles. Our public library system is great for many reasons. Its innovative programs and services, the great leadership of our library commissioners, and as I mentioned, our city librarian, John Zabo, who has been invited and honored at the White House. How many of us have had that happen, <laughs> right? He and Michelle Obama are like this. <laughs> the staff of professional librarians and the passionate support of Angelinos, especially those who dedicate time and energy as volunteers at our libraries. Colleagues, there are six 
1,250 people who volunteer at libraries across the city of Los Angeles. How about a big round of applause for that? And we figured out a way to monetize those volunteer hours. In 2016 alone, they provided more than 160,000 hours of service, valued at nearly $4,500,000. $4,500,000. Did the mayor talk about that in his budget yesterday? All right. Well, you know, volunteer, volunteers save the city money. And that's one of the wonderful stories here. They provide assistance to many library programs and serve in a variety of roles, including adult literacy, friends of the libraries, central library docents, homework assistants, star storytelling and reading program, adult book discussion leaders, a path to citizenship, money and health matters, financial literacy, children and teen summer reading clubs, library program aides, collection inventory aides, media technicians, special project aides, and teen volunteers. Volunteers greatly enhance the programs and services offered by the library and enrich the lives of people throughout the city. And I think many of us spent a lot of our formative years in our local public library or our library at our schools, like I certainly did. I practically lived there all through my childhood. Uh, I would just like to hide, uh, highlight a few of the volunteers uh, who, who volunteer at the libraries serving the great 13th Council District. And I, uh, Therese Dietlin, are you here from Atwater Village? If you are, raise your hand. Sue Lipman from Silver Lake Branch. James Castillo from the Echo Park Library. I know James is here. Yeah. Yay. Teresa Williams from the Wilshire Branch. Julio Rodriguez from the Edendale Branch. And Elson Trinidad from the Coenga Branch. I know Elson's here too. Right on. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, a personal friend of Michelle Obama, our <laughs> friend and colleague, and a real champion for youth uh, and for the library systems, not in, only in Los Angeles, but across the state and across the country, Mr. John Zabo. You bet. And Mr. Uh, O'Farrell, a damn good librarian. We're very fortunate to, to have you. You, uh, you have this very unique passion about you, organization about you, and, and I just think our system has, has gotten better since you've been the quarterback of the library team. So let's well, give him you another round thank of applause. You. You're a good man and a good librarian. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. And uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Mitch O'Farrell, Council President Wesson, and really the entire City Council for uh, taking time to acknowledge and celebrate the amazing dedication, hard work, and generosity of uh, over 6,200 people, uh, residents of this city who give of their time and energy to our libraries to help make our libraries better. They understand that libraries change lives. Uh, and we absolutely love these volunteers uh, at the Los Angeles Public Library. They are from uh, all ages, all parts of the city. Uh, people have come from uh, council districts throughout this city today uh, to be here uh, to represent our amazing volunteer corps. And as uh, the council member indicated, uh, they are contributing to all of the programs that the library provides, our New Americans initiatives, uh, our programs for toddlers, our programs for seniors, our technology programs our amazing 70 Friends of the Library groups. They're working on book sales to help raise money for the library. Um, and I'm so pleased that the City Council is honoring our volunteers here during National Volunteer Month. Uh, and we've just completed a wonderful celebration of libraries with National Library Week. Uh, and to demonstrate how valuable our volunteers are, uh, we have used national standards to, to uh, put a a price tag on that 160,000 hours that our volunteers contribute, as the council member mission, uh, mentioned. Uh, but of course, this contribution that they make is absolutely priceless, uh, and we really can't put a dollar value on it. But we're going to give you this check. Uh, a reminder, it is budget season. This is not a real check. Um, the check is written on the bank of good deeds, as you'll see. Uh, but again, uh, we want to demonstrate to you how much we love our volunteers and how much we value the very 
uh, important and valuable contribution that they make. Um, uh, every city department is not so fortunate as the library to have uh, the good people of the city contribute so many volunteer hours to, uh, to uh, the library, and we're, we're really thrilled. So again, thank you, Council Member uh, O'Farrell. Thank you, Council President Wesson, for all of your support for our libraries and in indeed the entire city council. Thank you all so much. Wonderful. And we have thank a check. You. You check the check? Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you all so much. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Fantastic. And so, oh, and so we're also going to present a certificate of recognition for Library Volunteer Appreciation Day this April 21st, 2017. Side too. Yeah. Big pictures? Okay, great. Great. Cool. So if everyone could follow William, we're gonna go outside for pictures as well. Okay, where everyone will be seen, it'll be on steps. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Mr. Clerk, we do have a quorum. Why don't we run through the agenda? Very Again, good, I want to thank the, uh, the uh, librarian and all their volunteers, but if we could go through the agenda at this time. Very good, sir. Bloomingfield, Bonnaboo, Scandio, Cedillo, and her host, Dustin Weezer, Koreska, Crane, Martinez, Sofero, Price, Rue, West, and 11 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Bloomingfield moves, Bond in seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Bonin moves. Bloomingfield seconds. Continue. Mr. President, there is a request to continue item 7 to Tuesday, April 25th. So without objection, so ordered. Very Continue. good. Continue. Uh, items 1 and 2 are items noticed for public hearing. Okay, Mr. Bonin. Uh, I'd like to move to receive and file item number 2. Okay, do you have cards? Business. Uh, yes, sir, we do have cards on item number two. And what did, did you say item one as well? Yes, sir, cards on both items. Okay, so then continue. Uh, items three through ten are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Again, do we have cards? Yes, sir, cards on items four, six, and nine, four, uh, six, and nine. Okay, hold those items. Let's prepare to vote on the remaining items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 eyes. Continue. Mr. President, that takes council back to presentations uh, or items called special. Okay, I'm going to look towards Ms. Martinez and to see if Ms. Mart Ms. Martinez would like to move forward. Hey. <laughs> I was at the dentist. Let's give these young ladies a round of applause as they come up. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now we get to talk about women athletes. Here we go. You ready? Well, good morning, members, Mr. President. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that my friend Ari Bennett, who's a principal at Poly High School, could not be here with us this morning, but he did send our assistant principal, Arden Arhenian, who's here on his behalf. So I want to thank, um, I know Arnie is watching, so 
Uh, thank you very much, Ari. For, I, I know you would have been here if you could. Um, but today I'm extremely proud to honor not only the champ champions, but strong women athletes in, in my district. It is with great pleasure that we recognize Poly High School's girls varsity volleyball team and their head coaches, Eduardo Alcatar, and girls wrestling team with their coach, Terry Gillard. What a privilege and an honor, I must say, to have two teams representing the Poly Parrots athlete department. These young women have made it clear that at Poly High School in Sun Valley, which I am very fortunate to call my neighbor, is home to two of some of the best academics in the city and in LAUSD as well as sports. First, I want to recognize Polly's girls volleyball team who went to finish with a record 19-6-2 this year, defeating the Los Angeles Wilson High School in the Division II LA City section champions this fall in 2016. Let's give them a big round of applause to our volleyball team. This is the very first city championship in volleyball for Poly High School since 1997, 20 years in the making. This is quite an achievement considering the odds were against these young ladies leading up to their accomplishments and having to bear the excruciating hot Valley summer practices outdoors while their gym was being renovated over the summer and going into their fourth coach in four years in their volleyball team. However, their head coach, Eduardo Alcatar, coming in with his ba um, background in basketball, I'm sorry, in baseball, and their assistant coach, Viredina Gallardo, were able to lead this team to many victories throughout the season, instilling in the, the basic principles of coaching that inspired, motivated, and supported these young ladies to become city champions. I believe that these young women should continue on with their education and giving back to their community. This is why I'm so proud to recognize them and for their economic accomplishments as well. Some of them are doing extremely well in the classroom. Some of their senior players are heading on to some of the best colleges and universities in our state, such as UC Santa Barbara, UC Berkeley, UC Irvine, Cal State Northridge, and Stanford. Give them a big round of applause. They're doing extremely well academically. So congratulations to our volleyball team girls as they became champions last year. I also want to recognize the next two young women. We are recognizing them today along with their coach, Terry Gillard, as a testament of young women breaking into the world of sports that historically have been non-traditional women's sports such as wrestling. I am very proud and excited to share with these young women and with you other accomplishments. But also, I'm extremely, extremely proud that these women did extremely well competing against some of the uh, more renowned women in sports across our city and in LAUSD. I want to recognize Christine Contreras, who wrestled at 150 pounds, is a second time, two-time champion, LA City champion and state finalist in 2016 and 2017. She's also placed first at the Birmingham and Poly tournaments. Let's give her a big round of applause to Christine Contreras. I do not want to mess with you. She uh, has also been a member of the Boys and Girls Club of the San Fernando Valley for three years and lives in Pacoima with her uncle and her grandmother. And she will be attending Cal State LA and majoring in criminal justice. So let's give her a big round of applause. Last but not least, uh, we also want to recognize Ms. Jaylene Avila, who wrestled at 101 pounds. She is a 2017 city champion and state finalist, boasting a record of 32 this year. She placed first at Bisham Amat, Birmingham, Eagle Rock, and Poly tournaments. And she, too, is a member of the Boys and Girls Club of the San Fernando Valley for the past four years. Jocelyn probably has achieved an academic GPA of 4.5. Yeah. This young woman has a 4.5 GPA, and she will be attending UC Irvine later this fall, where she's going to pursue a major in computer science and mathematics. Yeah. yeah. And I'm very, very proud to call Jocelyn my, my constituent. She lives in Panorama City. 
Both Christine and Jasmine were recently recognized in the Daily News and for other all girls wrestling first place team. So today I'm so proud to congratulate these two amazing, amazing athletes that are doing amazing things, but they're also proving themselves in the classroom as being some of the most uh, smartest women that we are currently have in LAUSD, and they're, they're, they're living up to their expectations, and I'm very proud of them. I know they're gonna do amazing things in this world, and I hope to see them back soon after they graduate. I wanna introduce their coaches, Coach Eduardo Alcatars, and also Coach Terry Giller to say a few words. Welcome, coaches. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Council and Councilwoman Martinez for inviting us. Uh, yes, it was an amazing season. Um, as volleyball coach and the, these amazing ladies behind me, uh, they did a great job staying focused, not only, not only on the court, but in the classroom. They're, they're good girls. I uh, expect them to go on after high school and do, and do their best and come back and give back to the community like many of us have done. Also want to recognize uh, real quick is uh, my other coach, Elton Ferry, who was behind me. He also helped in the process since day one, so I don't want to let his name be out. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks to Cesar uh, Huerta, who was from step one. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And here's uh, Terry Gillard, our wrestling coach. Thank you, council members, and uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman um, Martinez. And I'd like to thank our principal, Ari Bennett, for allowing wrestling at Pauley High School that took place four years ago. And I'll tell you, I graduated from San Fernando in 1977. Right. And I volunteered over at the Boys and Girls Club for over 27, 28 years. And it's about time that the ladies are out there on the mats in the state of California, especially in the city of Los Angeles, representing not only women, but the sport itself. And it takes principals like Ari Bennett and you council members to keep that going on. And I tell you, these are the two strongest women in the city of Los Angeles right now. Thank you very much, council members and Ms. Martinez. Thank you very much, Coach Gunner. You know, Ms. Martinez, if yes. I could just jump in for a hot second. I want to personally congratulate the, the ladies for your 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 being champions i want to acknowledge the the coaches i know how committed you are and and the extra time that you have to put in you guys could be doing other things but you recognize how important it is uh to have everybody try to be in good shape and work out but see sports and being on a team is like a magical thing i think it gives you such a head start when you go into the world, when you understand how to work as a team. So I want to congratulate you. But where are the two wrestlers? Where are the champs? Now, members, members, members. I wrestled. Okay. Wrestling is not like what you see on TV. They are not flying around in rings. and It, it is one of the toughest things in the world to do. I joined the wrestling team in college so that I could eat at the weight the table so there were no restrictions. And I only weighed like 98 pounds, and I wrestled at 108 or something so I could eat all I wanted. But I learned to appreciate the sport and I learned just how challenging it is. So to you two uh, young ladies, I want you to know that, that I know what you had to sacrifice. I know what you had to go through. And I just have to do this to you because I'm so proud. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I want to get a picture with my two wrestlers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so do we have our assistant principal here? Yes. Well, you want to say a few words? Come on, <laughs> just put the, put the phone down. You know, it, it's, you know what, uh, Coach, Gillard, Coach Gillard said something very special. Ari Bennett is, is such a special person, not only to me, because he's a friend of mine, but I've known him for um, well over seven years, um, and I worked with him very closely when I was on the school board. He's a very, very special man, but he also has a very, very 
special way of connecting with young people and giving them the benefit of the doubt. And unfortunately, we don't have enough people like Ari. I wish we can um, duplicate Ari in all of our schools and his leadership and his vision to empower young people to do their very best. And if it wasn't for him, you're absolutely right, Coach. He really does not only empower the students to do their very best, but he also cultivates a, a team environment within the, the faculty at Poly High School. And I could not be more proud of Benny, of uh, Ari, and I know he, could, he couldn't be here this morning, but I want to give our assistant principal a chance to say a few words on his behalf, because I am so proud of Poly. You guys are not only doing amazing work academically, but you're also empowering young women to do their very best. So come on up here and say a few words and represent our friend Ari. And uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Um, I'm proud of these girls on behalf of Mr. Bennett and the, all of the administration and staff at Poly High School. It's, um, we're usually recognized for academic achievements, so it's nice to you know, be a, a recognized for something athletics as well. Uh, but I know it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of work to be both a student and an athlete. And I'm proud of the, both teams, both uh, wrestling and uh, volleyball, and our coaches. It takes a lot of dedication to volunteer a lot of those hours with not a lot of uh, you know, compensation in there. But uh, they all did an amazing job, and I'm proud of them. I'm not doing Mr. Bennett any justice, because he would be a lot more eloquent than I am. Great. But thank you. I appreciate uh, the time you've given us. Thank you. Okay, so I want to present our certificates. If I can find, oh, here they are. All right, so on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, this is for our girls wrestling volleyball champions. Let's give them another big round of applause. Way to represent, ladies. Here we go. And as well to our, our Valley champions. Thank you very much, colleagues. Let's go, Polly Parrots. Thank you very much for this. Here we go. You wanna? Okay, let's take it. Here, do you hold this one? Mr. Gillard? Hold that one or just switch? Do I go over to the Can I jump in here? Yeah, and then we're gonna take some in the back as well. So why don't you come here? And where are our ladies? Ladies? Squeeze on in, everybody. Squeeze on in. All right, colleagues, let's give them all another big round of applause. All right, on deck is uh, Council Member Bob Blumenfield. All right, let's welcome Councilmember Bob Blumenfield from the Great Third. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Council President, members. Uh, got with me some folks here today from the uh, Tarzana Culture, Community and Cultural Center, and we're here to honor a couple of special people. So I wanted to start out this morning uh, honoring Miss Helen Baker. Honoring her for her outstanding, can you hear me? Yeah, honoring her for her outstanding leadership Selfless, accompl selfless accomplishments and contributions to the Tarzana community. She is the founder and the president emeritus of the Tarzana Community and Cultural Center. Thanks to her, her generosity and hard work, Tarzana has one of the few parks of, or open green space along Ventura Boulevard. It's an amazing 
spot, and I urge you all to come check it out. Ms. Baker moved to the LA area to be a teacher within the LAUSD system in and, and Las Virginia school districts. She's dedicated her time and energy to charitable groups such as the Ebell Club of Los Angeles, the Assistance League, a homeless support group through her church, Girl Scouts, the Kiwanis Club, I could keep going on, the T Tarzana Property Owners Association. And after she and her family moved to Tarzana back in 1976, she worked in real estate here in the San Fernando Valley until 1999. She then invested in and worked for a cellular license service and helped make that business into a tremendous success. And when that business was sold, she used some of her proceeds to give back to her community in a very big way. From the early 50s through the next four decades, the southeast corner of Ventura and Van Alden was Diane and Rudy's garden statuary, a rustic wooden outlet known to all of us in the valley. But after that, the parcel seemed destined to be converted into a public storage facility. That was a concern to, to Helen and to a lot of folks. So she made a generous financial contribution and established a foundation to purchase the property. And along with many others who believed in this dream to turn it into an open space where anyone who wishes can stop by and take a deep breath under the canopy uh, of the trees and just the, the amazing loveliness of the spot. The Tarzana Community and Cultural Center was born, became an independent 501c3 in the spring of 2002. Since its opening back in 2002, I, I don't know, could you imagine back then what it would have become? Could any of you here who are part no. of that board imagine at that point? No. I know some of you had the vision, actually. I shouldn't say that. You guys had the vision, and you imagined what it would be. But to the rest of us, uh, people driving by in Ventura and everything else would say, well, gosh, what's, what, what could it be? And what it, what it has become is a host to art and antique shows, music galas, garden events, wedding birth, birthdays, uh, even a magical fairy hunt, which uh, I know because my, my kids and daughter has enjoyed uh, all sorts of community events. I'm out there all the time for, for one thing or another, uh, and it really has become uh, an oasis for the community uh, and just and one that your vision has made happen. So we're here to, to honor her today for being a, a, a pillar in the West San Fernando Valley, for having uh, the vision uh, and the foresight with the, with the cultural center to make it happen and, and to have given back so much to our community. So I have a, a certificate for you, which Svetlana has. Oh, here we go. Jeff has a little uh, certificate that's signed not just by me, but by all of the, the council members before you to show you that the city of Los Angeles appreciates uh, what, you've, what you've done and what, you're, what you've brought to all of us. And if you want to say a word or two, uh, please. Thank you, Councilman Blumenfield. Uh, I am honored to accept this on behalf of the Tarzana Community and Cultural Center and all the many volunteers who have helped make it what it has become today. They should be sharing this honor. I first read about uh, the idea of the community uh, obtaining that commercial corner venture in Van Alden and um, a 1999 uh, Tarzana Property Owners Association newsletter. And, um, I was interested, I love the idea of a community with a heart or center. After all, I'd grown up in small you know, a small neighborhood in North Carolina uh, where people are on a first name basis with each other. But it was six months later before it actually dawned on me that maybe I could or should be the one to help make that happen. So I went down to the uh, Diana and Rudy's garden statuary business to look at the property, and I looked at it in a different way. I already had, I didn't go to buy a fountain, I already had one in my yard, like many people in Tarzana still do today, but I looked at it and I saw uh, what I thought it could become, a place where children, adults, and seniors can enjoy the beautiful garden outdoor areas, uh, be with each other, share uh, music, art and cultural events uh, from our community and beyond, uh, all backgrounds, uh, learn things in classes for children and adults, 
And I, I just, I thought, this has to happen. So I called everyone I knew to ask, do you think it's a good idea? Do you think people will support it? The response was great. After all, where there's yard signs in people's yards saying, save our corner, not another strip center, people will rally to help something they're afraid of uh, before they will give money just to help something they think is a good idea. Uh, and I also went door to door with flyers about what we had in mind. Um, I was comfortable doing this, knocking on doors, because after all, I'd been a real estate broker, and here I really didn't have to worry about people saying, no, I'm not interested. It was their community. It wasn't for me this time. Uh, got many people to join our effort. Many of you are still here supporting us today, and some of you are in this room today. And some of our founding board members are still here. Many of them are up here with me. Um, we held old-fashioned parlor meetings with wine and cheese. Uh, the first one was in the home of a community leader that I had never met. And at that, uh, at that get-together, another person I did not know came up and handed me a check for $1,000. Now, this is showing faith for someone else's idea. Uh, we were represented at the Tarzana Street Fair with a booth and, of course, the wild African animals in the background. Uh, we got attention that way, letters to the community, uh, and then it was followed with uh, seed money to establish the foundation and money from many, many donors uh, started offers to the storage company to purchase the property. Uh, but they held firm at their price of $1,800,000. While we were doing all this, somehow Sheila Kuehl, who was with our state, um, Leg who was a state legislator at the time, heard of our efforts, and she sponsored a bill for $250,000 with another 100000 for the next year. Uh, but the state financial situation uh, got a little less comfortable, and um, she had Fran Pavley call me and say, please call and write everyone you know, ask them to write letters to the governor, tell him, please don't line out that extra 100000 The community needs it. And I asked for copies to be sent to me as well as to the governor, and some of them almost made me cry. So I thought, people really do want this. Then we closed, we got the property finally, after many offers, and closed escrow in the spring of 2000. Um, we worked to clean up and clear the property. We got a surprise. Under all those layers of pine needles from those beautiful, stately, almost 70-year-old pine trees planted by the original builder of the under 1,700 square foot, charming Spanish Revival building, Diana DeLugge, she and her husband Rudy had uh, Diana and Rudy's garden statuary business where she raised her children and ran the statuary uh, business. Under all those pine needles, we found tons of asphalt and concrete we had to haul away. Now, that's not glamorous. It doesn't look good to the community, but they still had faith and kept helping us anyway. Among our earliest supporters were Vivi and the late Milt Davidson, uh, who, uh, who were at that first dinner at my house to tell people about it. Uh, Vivi, here she is. Hi. And later, um, Vivi and I were talking about how much we loved gardens because by then the community center property had been converted to a beautiful garden like Diana DeLugge had in the, in the late in 1949 when she built the house and the 50s and 60s. And Vivi and I were talking about gardens and I said, and my other favorite thing is good books. And somehow when I mentioned my favorite book being The Secret Garden when I was young, <laughs> Vivi started jumping up and down. <laughs> Vivi, can I tell them how old you are now? Uh, she's, Is it she's okay? 95. It's okay. You can start bragging after you hit a certain age. I don't, I'm not quite there. Maybe. Yeah. So I still lie. Anyway. Oh, I'll um, tell you how old I am. Oh, did I miss a year? Okay, I'll Vivi. Be, I'll be 96 in July. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, Vivi knew what she wanted to donate. It was a secret garden. And of course, among the contractors we brought down for her to choose from, she chose the one that we knew would take the longest, drive the board members crazy, <laughs> but would get totally involved 
in the book, the video, everything he could find out about what might have been in the secret garden, and he did a beautiful garden, which I invite all of you to come and see anytime, complete with a grotto and a gurgling little pool and old-fashioned looking roses and places to sit, and many people come down and meditate, and they considered a, a place where the sounds of Ventura Boulevard just fade away, you don't even hear them. Um, we had generous donations from individuals and businesses. Uh, the gazebo was donated by Mr. Gazebo Man. Uh, our koi pond by uh, a man in our community who builds um, who builds uh, water features and now a lot of um, dry weather drought tolerant features. Uh, we had um, the uh, we had many matching funds grants. For, is my time out? Oh, okay, but, <laughs> but we had matching funds grants from the community. I have to say one last thing, though, about I still have dreams. Uh, we had the Rose Garden, which a local uh, family-owned business donated the roses for, and to recruit volunteers, uh, and we've had many wonderful volunteers over the years. Many things there have been either donated or just by hard work given by volunteers. But I tell them that it's a good place to come and volunteer and meet people. After all, I met my husband there of five years, Roger, who's right there. Wait, Roger. <laughs> Who was leading a kid's day camp at the center. And uh, it's just, and Edgar Rice Burroughs' legacy is preserved there in our little museum. And my dreams go on of a place where uh, seniors can be picked up from their homes. They're housebound. Their kids will take them shopping or to the doctor or their caregivers. They want to be with other people their age. I know I'm, get, I'm, I'm one now. And uh, so I, I dream of a bus taking them down to the center to organize card games, lunch, whatever they want to do. <laughs> Uh, and then the bus taking them back, picking up kids after school and taking them down for after school activities. We need, we need funding. We are not supported by the city except with all the wonderful support of uh, first Dennis Sign, Councilman Dennis Sign, and now Councilman Bob Blumenfield. And we just, we couldn't do it without their support. Right. Thank you. Oh, and I know that our public servants our public servants are not supposed to accept gifts, but this is a little souvenir. It's it's a baby of one of our majestic 70 or so oh, wow. tall pine trees. <laughs> Thank you, you can plant it in your yard or in a park, and maybe your grandchildren will see it be as tall as the ones at the center now. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Great, great story, great history for, for the Cultural Center, and it, it really... Uh, one thing that you underscored, and I want to I recognize one more person from this group, because you underscored that there was the vision uh, to make this happen and all the folks who were dedicated to make it happen, but on a daily basis, it's run by volunteers who make it happen, and I want to recognize one of those folks, Miss um, Amaris Breyer, who's here today uh, with us for her unwavering commitment. She is the president of the Tarzana Community and Cultural Center. She makes it happen uh, all the time. And she is someone who has been a lifelong volunteer. She has helped the city. She served for seven years as a docent uh, at the LA Zoo. In her career, she's had a world focus as a travel agent, traveled the world with her husband, Philip. Um, after owning the travel ticket in Encino for more than 20 years, she now works for World of Travel in Woodland Hills. Although she's seen the world, she sees the big picture, she focuses locally in Tarzana and makes and brings the world to all of us and makes a world of difference. So uh, I've got a certificate for you as well, uh, recognition for Amaris. Amaris, do you want to say a, a quick word? Do you want to say a quick word? Yeah, one, one quick word. Yeah. You can hold that hold one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Helen, I used most of my words, but I still got some words left. What I've seen here this morning is a hundreds of young people volunteers. And our heart goes out to those young people volunteers because of their youth and future. But in fact, volunteers who work just as hard and deserve just as much credit are older volunteers. 
We started with our first one who's 96. I'm almost 82. There's a whole bunch of them back here who are trying to catch up with me, and we are These are the constant. younger volunteers, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and we are constant volunteers. I've lived in the city of not always angels, but when I moved to Tarzana, I found my city of angels, and I found Helen Baker, who uh, had me come onto the board 15 years ago. Our hard work and dedication is what volunteering is about, but it is wonderful to see the fruits of our efforts. I would like to tell you that currently the uh, center uh, provides meeting spaces for such diverse groups as Winds, uh, Wings Over Wendy's, and which we have a few uh, uh, members of that group here. We have had uh, a meeting space for the Tarzana Property Owners Association and uh, formerly for the Tarzana Neighborhood Council. We want to be the center of, of Tarzana. Um, the, the, we also have boys and girls scouts uh, meetings at our place. We have art classes, dance classes, stretch classes. And we have, uh, and we're very proud of our cultural diversity. We're going to have a Spanish immersion class this summer. You want to brush up on your Spanish or learn it starting from the beginning? Come to the center. Pack a lunch. Bring it to the, to the uh, center. Van Alden and Ventura. Have your lunch by the pond and listen to the birds and watch the butterflies. And then you will see why we are so valued in the community. Uh, as you leave, uh, uh, introduce yourself to Peter uh, Jean Salute, our new executive director, who will uh, give you a business card with our uh, social media addresses. And come and get acquainted with us. We're the only thing like us in this city. Thank you. Great. Mr. Englander. Hey, I just wanted to, uh, Bob, real quick, I just wanted to give a shout out and thank you guys. I know um, what you're doing is just incredible, and a shout out to Athena for dragging my wife down there to volunteer as well. I know Jane loves you guys, so keep up the great work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. And let's give it up for the Tarzana Cultural Center, Community, community Cultural Center. Let's, let's go over to the corner. Okay, why don't we recess, Mr. Clerk, and go into the special? Very good, sir. Blumenfield, Bonnie Buscan, El Cedillo, Andrew Harris, Dawson, Weezer, Carrasco, Corinne, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rue, and Wesson. That's uh, 10 members. Okay, let's deal with item uh, 11, Mr. Murphy, Sean Murphy, on item 11. Come on, come on down. And, Mr. President, for the the public's benefit, there has been a substitute resolution for item number 12 uh, that has been circulated and posted. Good morning. Item 11 is a, no good, is a good item. I'm supporting this item. Thank you. Let's prepare to vote on that item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Okay, now let's go to item... 12, uh, Mr. Uh, Gus, Mr. Herman, uh, Mr. Spindler on item 12 of the special. Good morning, council members. Daniel Gus, actually just speaking as a member of the public today. Uh, item 12, fantastic, fantastic. You get rid of the cars and prostitution stings from the Johns, the hookers, the pimps, but you're not going far enough. Where is your effort to seize all electronic devices? You're stopping only the transportation devices. That's fantastic. That's great. Why aren't I seeing an effort to seize all phones, pagers, uh, iPads? Why aren't you stopping the communication so the girls, or the guys for that matter, aren't speaking to their pimps and they're not coordinating? This is a good effort but it's not a complete effort. If you're not doing a full job, you're failing your goal. Get on it and 
come up with a law so that you can seize the electronic devices. It not only stops communication, it's a font of information. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Herman, Mr. Spindler, Mr. Walsh. Mr. Herman, please come forward. So I had to wear my gangster suit today because there's just so much prostitution and pandering in Van Nuys that I had to come here and speak out and protest against all the pimps, all the whores, all the prostitution that you allow to go before our children and lie. Stop the nonsense. Stop the lying. Mr. President, the speaker is off topic. This is regarding the Thank seizure you. and impoundment of vehicles. And so when the rookie says to me, he's off topic, all Mr. I can Herman. say to you is allow the local agencies to do their goddamn job to enact the legislation to incarcerate these pandering pedophiles like LAUSD. We had a presentation Okay, thank here you, Mr. Herman. Thank you. Mr. Spindler, Mr. Herman, your time's expired. Mr. Uh, Herman, your time's expired. Mr. Spindler. Well, go ahead. Hold on a second. La Mr. I'm going to warn you, Mr. Herman, if you disrupt the meeting again, you'll be asked to leave. Mr. Spindler. Yes, good. I will defer to my colleague on these things. What do we have? Pimps. Yes, pimps. And then we have those nice ladies with the heels. What do we call them? Undercover vice cops. Oh, they're so sexy. Oh, yes, I love these prostitute fake cop undercover. Mr. President, the speaker's off topic. Get on topic, Mr. Spindler. It's because under the California Penal Code, you're trying to seize vehicles in an entrapment. And nobody knows it's entrapment because all the pimps and prostitutes are in Nori Martinez's district. And she has pimps on her staff that get stripped. Okay, now variances. you're off topic. Mr. No. Spindler, thank you. Thank you. So is it uh, Mr. Walsh? Your time's expired. John Walsh blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org or Jay Walsh Confidential tweeting at Hollywood Dems. This is number 12. This would amend the California Vehicle Code to allow local agencies to enact legislation for the seizure and impoundment of vehicles uh, used in the commission of an act related to prostitution, pimping, and pandering. Why don't you have that law now? Why isn't that law now? I just want every criminal out here, every child uh, molester, everybody's got a 12, pimping a 12-year-old girl that uh, under the law now, they don't seize your car unless in the past three years you've had a conviction for child molesting. I'm telling you right now, I can't believe you don't give a syphilitic rat's ass about children. The state doesn't give a syphilitic rat's ass about children. And all you uh, panderers, go out there and wor don't worry about your vehicle. Thank you. The city won't take Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, I think we have a few votes on this. Yes, sir, that's correct. It's a two-vote item. The first is on whether to substitute or not, and uh, the second is on the Okay, so matter. let's uh, vote on the to substitute. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Now let's actually vote the item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. And Ms. Martinez, it's my understanding you want this to go urgent. So let's vote on urgent forthwith. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Uh, Mr. Clerk, so is this all of the items in this special? Yes, sir, that is okay, correct. Okay, then why don't we adjourn and, and return to the regular? Very good, sir. Okay, we'll start out with our... Uh, the multiple section. So I have Mr. Walsh. Mr. Walsh, I have you on items one, two, four, and six, nine. And your public comment after that. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org 
or J. Walsh Confidential. Number one, building and safety, you're doing a good job. Remember, I'm not one of those guys to get up and say, oh, I'm a bunch of crooks, I'm a white man. I'm not. If you do a good job, I say you did do a good job. Uh, number two, this is a vacation. Okay, this is what they do. They take a little po a portion uh, that the developer wants, then they eminent domain it, and then they sell it to the developer who makes a, 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 uh, saves an enormous amount of money. Consultant servants, there's too many consultants. Right of way contracts to complete ongoing tasks. This is number four, epic land so, uh, solutions. Uh, much too much money being spent, much too much on consultants. Never mind your multi-billion dollar contracts uh, budget. These are consultants. Uh, number six, this is housing uh, pursuant to charter set. Okay, what is an exemption of one senior project coordinator mean? It means say, uh, uh, say somebody up here, uh, Mr. Englander has a friend who doesn't qualify for a job under the rules, they don't qualify. So they stick this in here, and what that means is it's an exemption. And they can hire anybody. They can hire anybody that, that has a heartbeat to take this job. This is a trick they play, all these extensions uh, and, uh, and replacements. Uh, number, number nine, okay. Whenever you see the word waiving something, that means the city isn't going to do something that they're required to do. They can waive anything. They can waive, uh, and this is what allow construction, okay, allow roadway associated with a new facility, value university preparatory high school. You, you move heaven and earth for charter schools, if this is a charter school. You'll do anything you, uh, to help a, a school. Uh, a charter school. Waive the city's one-year street cut moratorium to allow construction in the roadway. Construction in the roadway. I'm telling you, 11 people are run over walking in the street, walking on the road because of construction. Go back to New York and see how well they do it, how well they make the city, uh, the con contractor, build rights of way for pedestrians. Here you don't give a syphilitic rat's ass about uh, the, uh, the uh, pedestrian. And, th and this is another case, whenever you're out there and you almost get hit by a car, remember it's their fault. Okay, your general public comment, Mr. Walsh? John Walsh, blogging at hollywoodhighlands.org. Uh, I'm telling you right now, that the city of, uh, we had to listen to this nauseating self-congratulations for almost an hour. This one woman, what did she spend? 25 or 30 minutes just talking about how wonderful they are? I'm telling you right now, you're near destruction, self-destruction. I'm telling you right now, this city council is falling apart. We have got an enormous amount of information that we're, uh, people are talking to us. One of the city council members is under FBI investigation. And remember, I'm not against all of you. I think Gil Cedillo should win, because he's win but he should be reelected, because the scumbag that's running against him is a racist piece of shit that all he does is make jokes about Hispanics. Because he's a white man, and he's proud of it. And Mr. Cedillo, Thank he you. wants you to go to hell. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. So, Mr. Herman, you have items 1, 9, 11, and, oh, no, you have items 1 and items 9, and then you have your general public comment. So that's two minutes, Mr., uh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, he said. 11, 187 North DeHaven Avenue, $2,500. CD7. 11628 North Biltmore Avenue, $5,900. How much more do you want to gouge on these liens with the 250%? How much more do you want to cause emotional harm and distress to people who are living on their bottom line means? You haven't finished the problem with the homelessness. 
So who's the fucking asshole now? Now let me go to the next item, rookie. Rookie. He said I had to speak on item number. Yeah, whatever. Item nine. Yeah, that fucking number. So thank you for the construction on street cut moratorium. Fuck all your construction, because you still violate Willis versus Los Angeles and Barton versus Sacramento. You keep fucking with pedestrians right of ways and the path of travel and pedestrian use. ADA Title II discrimination, you stupid fucks. We keep paying more money to get our streets and our, and our infrastructure repaired, and yet you let that Jerry Brown clown from Sacramento put another tax against our ass. This is what I think about the taxes and construction, rookie. Mr. President, Fuck the speaker's you. off topic. And then my next item, which I feel... No, that's your off. last item. So if you're finished, let's so go to his general public comment, Mr. Nine. Clerk. Let's go to his general public comment. Okay, now, Mr. Herman, you're on general public comment. Oh, uh, you don't have to go that way with Nuri. She's a bitch, 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 because I'm telling you, she's a Mr. bitch. Okay, wait a, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what, cut his, cut his time. You know what, Mr. Herman? Mr. Herman, Mr. Herman, sit down, all right? Mr. Spindler, items one, two. No, now you're disrupting. Two, one, two. Mr. Spindler, you have four. Item six, and your public comment. Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm a product of the LAUSD. I have trouble remembering numbers. So, number one, CD7, no more liens. No more liens. You promised, Mr. Council President, when you illegally invaded and took over CD7, no more liens. Cancel them. F, we have a Nuri lien on FCD6, West Pimp. Street. Oh, no, I mean Plummer Street. I'm sorry. That's where the pimps are on Plummer Street. No more lean. CD1? Yes, Cedillo. 697. If you cancel this lean, I'll endorse your re-election. How about it? Good, thank you. All right. The rest of this shit. Number two. Right of way surrounding an island. You mean we own an island? Yay! I didn't know the L.A. city owns an island. Where is the island at? I would like to visit it. Maybe I can use that city-owned boat and sail to your island. Mr. President, the speaker's the off topic. Get back on topic, Mr. Spindler. Now we get to Plummer Street and CD12. Well... Mitchell Englander on Plummer Street does not allow pimps. So between Plummer Street and Darby, there is no pimping. You go east, back to CD6, Nuri has an amnesty for pimps. Now we go to the right-of-way consultant. Somebody tells me to go left. That's the right-of-way. I'm the right-of-way consultant, yes. You're going to pay me the puppet. Surprise, bitch. Yes, the right-of-way consultant is for me, Mr. Puppet. I will give the money to Mr. Spindler. Thank you. Goddamn. Yes, and now we will continue to file more city contracts for consultant services, especially with Dale Richardson and Associates. I see they're also on here as well. I urge Mr. Price to vote yes on item number four, since he's already committed a crime before, so do too, that's good. Now we get to HCIDLA. What does it stand for? It stands for Horseshit Community Investment Downtown Los Angeles. It's for horseshit. Vote no one seeks. Now we get to James Hill and Sons Pickle Works Building. They make pickles. I love pickles. 
vehicles, especially over at Paul Caretz's Mr. President, that item has been continued. All right, so let's get his general public comment. Give him his minute. Pickles. Pickle. Okay, so now the general comment. I believe Nuri was going to talk about what Mr. Herman said. She said she'd, quote, take care of it. That's a threat. Yes, Mr. That's a President, threat. the speaker's off topic. It's, but it's general public comment. When you threaten a public speaker, you are violating his constitutional rights under the California Constitution. It's called a Bain Act violation. Nuri is guilty of 52.1 CCP, the Bain Act. Mr. Herman will sue. Yes, and also, my friend here, Mr. Spinner, is the victim of more Bain Act retaliation. He just went to court and proved to a judge that a false gun charge was issued as the product of a false and sham restraining order. We'll see you in hell because we're going to throw it out and the judge wants it gone. You know why? Because they like me and they fucking hate Thank you. you. Thank you. Let's vote on item one. Let's uh, open. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, if I may, there's been a request for item one for the, from the Department of Building and Safety. They recommend that items 1E, 1F, 1K, 1L, and 1Q be received and filed in as much as the liens have been paid in full, that item 1M be received and filed in as much as the lien was rescinded, and that all remaining properties within item one be continued to May 26. Okay, so then without objection. Very good, sir. Oh, Mr. Murphy, item nine. Uh, yeah, this is Sean Murphy, uh, CD2. Item 9, I'm kind of against this item. Thank you. Let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. All right. Vote on items 4 and 6. Mr. Herman, be quiet. Okay, Mr. Herman, last warning. On items four and six, let's open the roll, cl close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten eyes. Now I want to go to item two. Uh, is it Gwen Quillen, Christopher McKinnon, Katherine Johnson? Please come forward. Just come on. Whoever's first to the mic, it's okay. I believe Chris McKinnon went to feed his meter. But um, My name is Katherine Johnson. I live at 4201 East Boulevard, directly across from the proposed vacation of the piece of the island. I'm here to um, ask you to um, deny or oppose the street vacation. Um, I, more than 40 of my neighbors have filed letters and signed petitions against this. Uh, we live in a unique pocket of Mar Vista, very close to Culver City, that has very wide streets and big setbacks and tall palm trees and allowing the um, homeowner to essentially annex almost more than 7,000 square feet of city property will double her land and allow her to subdivide or um, uh, build up and ruin the character of our neighborhood. Um, there is precedence for this. One of the other parallel islands in our community, a little triangle, this happened 20 years ago and it has Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning. I'm Gwen Quillen. I'm the applicant and the owner on behalf of myself and my three sisters. Uh, this is a triangle lot, one of four triangle lots on the Mar Vista Oval. And the street vacation that we are asking for is exactly what was granted to the closest similar lot uh, in 2005, and that's at 4162 Mar Castle. 
uh, we, had, we are not seeking the entire island. Uh, we're just seeking exactly what was granted before. The city would still retain a substantial parkway. I passed out a map, I think you all have that, uh, that shows the significant parkway that would still be retained. There's no lot splitting. Condition eight uh, of the engineer's report states that it will be held as one lot. We're not asking for a zoning change. And the, if, if, this, uh, if the engineer's recommendation is uh, accepted, and the, the Committee on Public Works um, recommendation approved, it would bring the Thank lot. you. May I just add one thing? No? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, uh, McKinnon, is he back? Will we go to Mr. Bonin? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I was inclined to, to move today to uh, receive and file this item. Uh, I'm concerned about doubling the lot, but uh, I have not had an opportunity to meet with the applicant. What I would like to do is meet with the applicant and the neighbors together. Uh, so what I'd ask is that we continue this for 30 more days, and I'll have an opportunity to meet with both sides, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll proceed after that. After that. Okay, so on this item, we're going to continue it till May 23rd. Mr. Bonin is going to try to convene a meeting with the applicant and the other neighbors and try to work some things out. So this item is continued until May 23rd. Okay, let's uh, go into general public comment. Mr. Murphy, Diane Fletcher Hope, Patty, I can't quite make out the last name, and a Corey Muniz. Muniz. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Mr. President, the means been run real well today. This is the way the means should be running. Once one item at a time, not multiple items. I'm it's you're running the meeting. I know you're the boss. So uh uh I'm having a birthday on Monday, folks. Let my fans know. Uh my church. After ten o'clock mass, after I'm done singing in the social center. Well, happy come, happy birthday, Mr. Murphy. Uh, yeah, I watched a speech last night. I listened to what Eric Garcetti had to do. Eric Garcetti has to do more than what he says. He's got to keep that promise. I'm s I did not reelect him. I'm sorry to tell you, but I say he should do a good job. Hope he does a good job and keeps his promises. Thank you, and again, happy birthday. So if I could get uh, Diane, Corey, and Mark. I believe it is. Yes, identify yourself. My name is Diane Fletcher Hoppy, and I'm here from Marina Del Rey to urge Council Member Englander to please introduce and pass a motion to shut down the Aliso Canyon gas facility. Also, please hire an independent consultant to study LADWP's ability to operate without the Aliso Canyon gas facility. Help the health of our neighbors. Help the health of our planets. This is each of yours opportunity to be proud of making our Los Angeles an energy smart city that is clean and green. Thank you. Thank you. So please identify yourself. Uh, Patty Glick. Given that there are serious concerns regarding seismic and fire dangers in Aliso Canyon, I respectfully ask the LA City Council to pass a resolution to support the permanent closure of the gas storage facility in Aliso Canyon. I also request the City Council to direct the DWP to fund an independent study into energy reliability, especially exploring non-fossil fuel and gas non-gas options. Let's protect the 200,000 residents of the northern San Fernando Valley who are still suffering from the poisonous chemicals that were spewed out into our environment during the 2015 blowout. We cannot afford to have this facility reopen at our risk. Let's make Los Angeles a shiny green city. We need to get this done before the murky swamp of Washington, Washington D.C. is allowed to destroy the environment we are handing off to future generations. Thank you so much. No, thank you. So if I could get the next speaker, if you'd identify yourself. Then after Mark, I'm looking for Daryl Gale and Dwight Hare. Yes. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Corey Muniz. I am an independent medical researcher and have been for over 30 years. I'm also a lifelong resident of the San Fernando Valley, and I am a uh, healthcare practitioner. And uh, I have not only seen uh, issues from the Aliso Canyon leak in myself, my neighbors, my clients, and it is horrendous and frightening. I am asking, please, for Los Angeles to have an independent study on the need for the Aliso Canyon facility and also support the shutdown of Aliso Canyon storage. As LAUSD has made a unanimous vote, Diane Feinstein and the fire department are all recommending a permanent shutdown, and I ask that you please consider this as well for the health of our children, our animals, and our planet. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Mark Greck, 12-year resident of Porter Ranch. Uh, the permanent closure is a simple common sense issue. It needs to be addressed in that manner. The Aliso Canyon gas storage facility is a rusting, unpredictable, antiquated facility situated smack dab in the middle of an earthquake fault zone, which is also smack dab in the middle of an extremely high brush fire region. You can continue to argue all day and night about energy reliability, despite the four independent studies that debunk the claim need for Aliso Canyon's existence. But the common sense answer to the argument is this one. One earthquake can change everything. The proximity of this facility to thousands of families, schools, businesses, churches, etc., more than obviously render this ticking time bomb an un unacceptable risk to Porter Ranch, Chatsworth, Granada Hills, and beyond. You can talk all day and night about improvements, testing, compliance, health studies, root cause, cause analysis, et cetera, et cetera, but one earthquake could mean a ca catastrophic disaster of epic proportions, and I doubt anyone wants blood on their hands or on their resumes. Thank you. Thank Mitch you, Singer, sir. Please, Thank uh, you. Help us. Thank you. Thank so you. if I could find Jane uh, Tanger or Tanger and Alec, uh, Alex Kim, and next speaker, ma'am, please come forward. Hi, I'm Daryl Gale. First, I want to thank uh, Council President Wesson on the study to have a 2,500-foot uh, setback for urban drilling. We really appreciate that. And on a related note, I want to say that the City Council really needs to have an independent study regarding LADWP's ability to operate without Aliso Canyon. And we ask Council Member Nuri Martinez to hold a hearing on, in the E&E &E Committee uh, so that LADWP can report on options to reduce gas and gas storage. Uh, recently, I've been studying a report. It's online uh, by Physicians for Social Responsibility, PSR.org. It's called Too Dirty, Too Dangerous, Why Health Professionals Reject Natural Gas. I want everyone to know and to read this and realize we cannot live with all this methane in our environment. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could have the next speaker, please come forward and identify yourself. My name is Dwight Herr, and uh, I'm a resident of Porter Ranch. I'd like to urge the City Council to uh, shut down or to permit, do something about permitting the uh, Aliso Canyon facility. And uh, I, I think it's much too dangerous. My wife and I lived there at the time of the uh, 1994 Northridge quake. There were fires on the hill above us in the facility. I believe that when we get the 7.0 earthquake that the area is capable of producing, this is going to be a disaster of epic proportions in the North San, San Fernando Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Next, and then if I get John, uh, is it? Uh, T. Boo and uh, Jason. Well, Jason's not here. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jane Tanger. I've been a resident in the uh, Porter Canyon for uh, Port Porter Ranch, excuse me, for uh, 30 years. And I'm still suffering symptoms from the, the blowout that took place in October of uh, 2015. And uh, my hair is, has been falling out, my fingernails are loose. I have, I wake up, I have terrible itchy rashes, and I urge the city council to do something about not letting the gas company reopen this facility. It's still leaking. Um, one estimate is twice a day that it's leaking. 
And we just, we just don't think it belongs in our community. They're still building houses in Porter Ranch. More and more people are residing there. And it, it's just not a safe place to have a gas storage facility. It's, it's been shown by independent studies that we don't need this gas. Most of it is there for storage, to sell, to resell. It, it, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So if I get Mr. Kim, then John and Candido. Yes, is Can yes. Hi, my name is Alex Kim, and I have lived in Port Ranch for the past 30 years. I'm a PRNC board member, but today I speak as a stakeholder. I'd really like to know why an independent energy reliability study has not been done. Is it because you are worried that the outcome of the study will hurt SoCal gas interests? If not, do the study. Is it because you worry about losing financial contribution from the gas industry? If not, do the study. Is it because you fear exposing all of the ugly things you have done in the past against public interest, such as not telling people what is up there on top of Alisa Canyon and allowing developers to build so many homes near the gas storage? If not, do the study. Is it because you do not want to step on others' toes? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So if I could get the next speaker, please identify yourself. And Candido, you're next, followed by Stacy. I think it's Hatch. Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks for letting me speak. My name is John Tebow. I'm a 15-year resident of Porter Ranch. I brought some uh, handouts for you all to what I'm going to be talking about in a little bit more detail, which is the time I have. Um, if you're looking for a smoking gun, to have the facility shut down, you need to look at the February 9th, 2017 SB 57 hearing where Jason Marshall, Deputy Director of the California Department of Conservation, says that off-gassing still occurs at Aliso Canyon and the soil is entrenched with methane and other pollutants. Um, when asked how long this off-gassing will last, he had no idea. He says he has no idea. When he was asked if it would take 500 years, the answer was they have no idea of knowing. And perhaps this off-gassing is, is what is causing the thousands of people that are still being sick and the possible cancers. So please do what you can to shut down and clean up the facility. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So Candido, Stacy, Rosalio, Mr. Gus, yes. What? Good morning, Mr. President, Council Member Candido Maris, proud resident of Porter Ranch, and honored to be represented by Ms. Mitch Engler. Um, the A team has gotten better. The 12th district is better. Eric Mooney is back. Worked for a, for a former councilman. Welcome back, Eric. I know that uh, you're like getting Magic Johnson back for the Lakers. So again, thank you very much. It's a it's a great move for the 12th district. In regards to uh, Steve Zimmer, um, I worked with him for almost 12 years uh, on the Cup Committee. And I truly believe he's a wonderful human being who really cares about our children. And I hope he uh, spends more time uh, on the board. And uh, again, uh, continue to come out here. We need to have you out here because the needs of the Valley are great. And sometimes we feel a little left out. But uh, thank you very much for being here in the, in the San Fernando Valley. Thank you. OK, please. And then I'm looking for Rosalio, Mr. Gus, and then uh, Alexandra Nagy. Yes, ma'am. Identify yourself. Hi, my name is Stacy Hashi. I am a resident of Porter Ranch. I have two children who attend Castle Bay Elementary School and were needed to relocate during the gas leak due to oily mists that were floating over their school during lunchtime. They, it was very dangerous. It was a noxious smell that they were having to live with. I also want to thank LAUSD for their support in shutting down Aliso Canyon. Uh, we urge Council Member Englinder to introduce and pass a motion in favor of decommissioning the Elisa Canyon Gas Storage Facility, rejecting SoCal Gas's application to reopen. We also demand the city to hire an independent consultant to study LADWP's ability to operate without Elisa Canyon to follow up on the LA County EES consulting report. And I ask that the Council stop LADWP from continuing their ads about the need for gas conservation. We call it blackout blackmail. It's misleading and it's serving the Los Angeles community deceptively. Thank you. Thank you. So R R Rosalio Alvarez. 
Yes, sir. Hi, I'm um, Rosalio Olivares, um, a local homeless man from the Van Nuys community. And um, I come here today um, with the with the sincerest concern and, and my deepest fear um, to address a matter that um, not only needs to be um, like more focused on, but should should definitely be more acted upon in a in a, in a more thorough manner. As far as um, you know, I I understand what the what the real needs are here for as far as the homeless communities is concerned, and, and we're not talking about just you know you know just giving us things and, and just expect us to just go on our way. I'm talking about like being more civically involved as, as a community and you know more than anything not just as figureheads but as a community to you know let people know that that they could still attain their dignity if they have lost it you know or if they still have it to keep it and um, thank yeah. you sir thank you thank you mr. Gus followed by Alexandra Nagy yes sir Council members, uh, Daniel Gus, just speaking as a member of the public today, my new article on City Watch is being evaluated by the FBI about Mr. Price. Mr. Price's own attorney, Stephen J. Kaufman, implicated Mr. Price, absolutely connected to fraud, to perjury, and bigamy, not by error, but deliberately. Mr. Price misused a process server that he sent to his own house to represent to the court that he couldn't locate his first wife. Uh, the problem is now for Mr. Price, who, by the way, just hired his third divorce attorney, which means he knows that he's married to two women right now, a blonde guy named Sven from Orange County, which means that Mr. Price's marriage to his second wife, Dell, is null and void in the eyes of the law. The problem is now that he's being investigated by the FBI, which of you is he going to sell out to save his own self? Ms. Nagy. Good morning. My name is Alexandra Nagy. I'm the senior organizer with Food and Water Watch. I first wanted to thank uh, President Weston and the council for starting the study on the 2,500-foot buffer to end neighborhood drilling in Los Angeles. Thank you so much for that. I also wanted to thank Councilmember Englander and Councilmember Bonin for introducing a motion directing DWP to report back on eliminating gas use and gas storage in Los Angeles. Um, this has been referred to the E&E Committee, and Councilmember Martinez, I respectfully ask you to bring this before the committee so we can get DWP started on this process. Um, based on the last conversations we had with DWP power executives, um, about energy reliability without Aliso Canyon, they said SoCal Gas says we will have blackouts if we don't get Aliso Canyon back online. This is why it's really important that we not just have DWP do their own work, but we hire an independent consultant to verify their work just like LA County did. So we respectfully ask you to do that. I have a letter here to distribute as well as an article to distribute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. That concludes uh, general public comment. Mr. Clerk, uh, what items or what business is before this body? Mr. President, Council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted. They are referred. The desk is clear. Uh, announcements, members, announcements. If I could ask all to please rise. For adjourning motions, if all in the... Uh, Chambers would please rise. I am looking to my right side. Mr. Koretz. Mr. President and uh, colleagues, it's, it's with a heavy heart that I ask that we adjourn in memory of my friend Leslie Gersikoff. Leslie passed away early Monday morning after a massive stroke over the weekend. She was 69. Leslie was born in 1947, grew up in Rochester, New York, and she attended the State University of New York in Buffalo. During her time on campus, she became active in social issues. After moving to Los Angeles, she became a tireless fighter for a more just society and a better, more equitable Los Angeles. She was unfailingly on the front lines of seemingly every battle on behalf of the vulnerable and the voiceless. She identified strongly with the Jewish social justice tradition and was committed to what in Hebrew is called tikkun olam, or healing the world. For the past decade, she served as the executive director of the Jewish Labor Committee Western Region, 
uh, a position that uh, she followed me into. Uh, I did that in 2008, and I helped to uh, hire her in the selection process. Uh, she was a tremendous choice, and she was simultaneously active in an array of other organizations and causes, from Labor United for Universal Health Care, which she was the secretary, to the Fix LA Coalition Fighting for Good Jobs and Quality Public Services for LA Residents. Uh, Leslie seemed to be forever running between demonstrations and marches and pickets and meetings, and if she ever declined apologetically to be at a rally or event, it was invariably because she was already going to be at another one. She fought for the farm workers, she fought for women's rights, she fought for the dignity of the oppressed, she fought for working families struggling to make ends meet. Um, she was a giving person who gave freely of all her time and energy to helping others. She was loved and adored by the labor community, and she was guided by the Jewish tenant of Masim Tovim, a life of good deeds. Uh, her memory will live on forever in the hearts of those who knew her, and our prayers are with her brother Robert during this difficult time. May her memory be a blessing. Okay, so I'm still looking to my right. Uh, let's have Mr. Blumenfield. Please. Fritz, if I can add on, add on to that, uh, I was shocked by her passing. She truly was a, a, a wonderful person. Uh, blessed to have gotten to know her as well, and uh, she will be sorely missed. If we can make sure to the city clerk that you have this as a two signature, Mr. Sadia, three signatures on Let this. me... Um, Add to that, Paul, thank you for doing that. I love Leslie. She was awesome. And, um, you know, uh, Mr. President, we spend a lot of time doing this work. And then we go to these uh, conventions that we have and our meetings and our coalition meetings, et cetera. And she was always positive. She was one of those persons that uh, sometimes these meetings are a little challenging, a little difficult, cumbersome. Uh, but when you saw her, it was... Uh, you felt you were doing something worthwhile. And she was always uh, just positive. I mean, just like a smile. Like you knew when you saw her, like this is what you should be doing because she's here. And, you know, she was only there because it was the right thing to do. And I just loved her. She was just so uh, just extraordinarily pleasant and uh, optimistic and positive and I'm, I'm in as much shock as anybody else that uh, she's not uh, going to be around uh, for the next meeting, and uh, we, she will be sorely missed. Okay, so three signatures. I'm now looking to my left. Any adjourning motions to my left? I don't see any, any other adjourning motions to my right. I don't see any members. This meeting's adjourned. Jane Skeeter. I'm the CEO, founder, and president of Ultra Glass. Ultra Glass Inc. is an architectural designer and manufacturer of specialty glass. We're situated in Chatsworth in the city of Los Angeles. We're on over an acre with a 25,000 plus square foot facility. Glass has properties that people don't realize. It makes it so versatile, so durable, so functional. In terms of architecture, and art and engineering, glass is the perfect medium. We are really collaborators here. We work with a specifier, architect, designer, somebody who has a project to actually enhance their work. So it makes the space feel better, look better, 
and function better. We recently completed a large project, our largest ever, it's a hospital in Kuwait. We did the facade, which is the area between the windows, six levels or floors of our glass. Each piece of glass had a specific spot on the building. Shipping was a real challenge on this project, as you might imagine. We had to figure out a way to ship it from our dock in containers through the port of LA, through China, and all the way to Kuwait without breakage. 5,000 panels, they all survived. There's no better material to work with that satisfies my architectural love and passion for creation and designing and making things with my hands. I first got interested in stained glass and did it in my garage, started hiring people. We have staff that's been here for over 30 years. As we grow or get larger projects, we will expand sometimes up to over 40, 50 people. And now we've gone from the garage to global, doing projects all over the world. They can measure it even. But with this equipment, we are able to do that now. The information of the infrastructure can be kept in a database. At certain milestones, you scan the complete site. So when you're done, you almost have an x-ray vision so you know what's behind walls. If you want to paint the walls, you know exactly how much square foot there is. If you need to put a pipe through the wall, you know you're not going to hit. We not only know the width and the height of the pipe, but we can know when it was installed, who the manufacturer was, when it was retrofitted, when it was replaced. It's the information about the life of the building from its infancy to its eventual teardown. Now, just imagine with this accurate information, how could we accurately ask a contractor to do some construction work? Not only that, keep the data like Tony mentioned before, keep the data for the future maintenance as well. So it's enormous help, time saving, money saving. It's neat that, the, that Tony had the foresight to move the survey into another direction. As we move, we move other people within the Bureau with us. It is becoming a standard in the industry. I'm proud of our Bureau of Engineering that we're able to keep up with the curve. We're going into a new phase of surveying. We're getting into areas that land surveyors weren't involved in before. It is a new opportunity, I think, and a new avenue for growth for the surveying profession. Today is the 25th annual Los Angeles River Cleanup, La Gran Limpieza, which is when we bring people down to the river by the thousands to pick up trash. Plastic, foam, fast food wrappers. The trash comes from a lot of sources, but primarily it comes from every storm drain in the city that drains directly into the Los Angeles River. After a storm, it's dangerous because anything could be floating down the river at that point. And one of the real issues ahead of us is to figure out how to restore the watershed. The Tillman plant is an incredibly positive addition. It's a water cleaning facility. The water coming out of Tillman is a very high level of tertiary treated reclaimed water. When it comes into the Los Angeles River, it's a level that the state health department says can be put onto food crops. A very high level of water. I'm Hiro Neto. I'm the plant manager at the Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant. And what we do here is we treat wastewater and we make good quality effluent for the LA River. I manage the Los Angeles River Watershed Monitoring Program and I see the water in the river but I'm interested in taking a tour today to see how you take wastewater and turn it into nice clean disinfected water that gets discharged. So can you give me a tour today? Of course, let's do it. Okay. We're standing in front of the Headworks facility and this is where the sewage first enters the treatment plant. The plant handles about 40 million gallons per day. The sewage comes from basically northwest San Fernando Valley. It's an area of about 700,000 to 800,000 homes, mostly residential, not much industrial waste. This is also the first step in the wastewater treatment process for this treatment plant. Over here we have screw pumps that lift the sewage in order to give us gravity flow downstream. 
We also have bar screens that capture any large debris or material that might come in with the sewage. So the water's come into the facility, we've removed the larger material and we're here now at the primary settling tanks. Can you explain what happens next? Sure. As the water flows through the plant, it comes in at about three feet per second. So the intent here is to have the water enter a very large volume, which slows it down. And once you slow it down, the heavy grease material will settle to the bottom and the lighter grease material will flow to the top. And our job here is to remove that material. And where do you take the material that settles to the bottom? Well, we skim it from the bottom and also from the top, and then we send it back into the sewer system. And eventually it ends up at Hyperion Treatment Plant, where they process it into digesters and turn into biosolids. Okay, so where are we now? Well, what you're looking at is the secondary aeration process. This is where we duplicate what nature does in rivers and streams, except we capture it in a much smaller area, make it very ideal for nature to do its course, and enhance the process itself. The wastewater comes out of primary and now serves as food for the microorganisms that are already in the aeration tanks. We call this activated sludge. It consists of amoebas, flagellates, ciliates, very small bacteria that actually consume the pollutants. So given that there's so many bacteria at work here in this process, how come we don't see them in the effluent? You should not see any bacteria in the effluent. Of course, when you feed bacteria, they multiply, correct? Yes. So we maintain just enough organisms to match the amount of wastewater coming in, which serves as their food source. So it's a fine balancing act that we have to do about every day. We're standing in these secondary settling tanks. The flow from the aeration tanks, where all the bacteria are, now flows to the secondary tanks, where it's slowed down even more. Here we allow the uh, slush and bacteria to settle to the bottom and also to flow to the top. Again, we skim them off and we send it back to the aeration tanks. The excess growth of bacteria that we do have, we waste. We send that back to the sewer system and that goes back to Hyperion eventually. Okay, and so the water from here now, is this good enough quality to discharge into the Los Angeles River? No, not quite. It still needs to be filtered and disinfected. But what you see here is the flow that's coming out of the secondary selling tanks. It's now flowing in this direction and going into our filters. And once the flow goes through the filters, we remove any remaining particulate matter down to maybe 10 microns. And this flow from here will then flow into our final treatment process. We are standing on our chlorine contact basis. This is where we add chlorine that you see in the tanks behind me, sodium hypochlorite, into the effluent to disinfect any remaining bacteria in the water. But we don't want chlorinated water ending up into the LA River. That's correct. So we have one final step. We add bisulfide in the final effluent channel, which actually dechlorinates the water. So by the time it gets to our discharge points, there should be zero chlorine remaining in the water. Wow, so that's pretty high quality water that you're discharging. We're required to monitor seven days a week, 24 hours a day but we've been in compliance continuously for quite a while now, so we intend to keep it up. So obviously the habitat in the LA River require or rely on the water coming from this treatment plant. So does all of the water from here end up in the LA River? A lot of our water is used for irrigation, and that's purple pipe. And that irrigation is for landscape purposes, for our Japanese garden, for the parks, for the golf courses. The remaining water does flow through the river. What do you think of our water quality downstream? The Los Angeles River Watershed Monitoring Program does sample some sites downstream of the discharge and the water quality there seems pretty good. So you guys are doing a great job, but once it enters the urban system, there's so many other pollutant sources from urban runoff to commercial and industrial inputs. So really it's up to the residents of the watershed collectively to work together to help improve the water quality. And that might be as simple as just picking up trash, not letting oil and fertilizers run off their gardens. So it really is a larger effort than just what you guys are doing here. The primary thing is to be conscious. Things that you throw out your window of your car, or things that you dump into the storm drains, it'll all end up in the LA River and the ocean. Come down to the river, if you see something trashy, pick it up and put it in a trash can. That's where it belongs. Once you actually start spending time here and you see uh, the number of birds and other things that are living in the river, realize that it's a little ecosystem right in the heart of our city. Get out here and enjoy the river, walk along the river, pick up trash as you're, as you're out enjoying the river. Come to the river and enjoy it because the more you're aware of a resource, the more you're going to be vested in its success and taking better care of it. Does the river belong to us? Yes! yes. Does the river belong to our community? Yes! Let's get out there and clean up some trash. Thank you very much.
The history of American Railroad dates back as far as the early 1800s. Over the next century, railroad workers installed over 200,000 miles of tracks all over the country. Rail was laid, bolted, and spiked down. In the early days, trains were primarily used to transport goods and livestock. However, in May 1869, that all changed when the railheads of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads finally met at Promontory Summit in Utah. People could now travel across the country in a matter of days, something that previously took weeks, sometimes months. In no time, plans were made for a train station in Los Angeles. Soon enough, construction began, and finally, in May of 1939, Union Station opened its doors to the public. The station took over service from La Grande Station and Central Station, and originally served the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railway, Southern Pacific Railroad, and Union Pacific Railroad, as well as the Pacific Electric Railway and Los Angeles Railway. Conceived on a grand scale, Union Station became known as the last of the great railway stations built in the United States. It was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. Union Station was partially designed by John Parkinson and Donald B. Parkinson, who had also designed Los Angeles City Hall and other landmark Los Angeles buildings. They were assisted by a group of supporting architects, including Jan van der Linden. The structure combines Dutch colonial revival architecture, mission revival, and streamlined modern style with architectural designs such as the eight pointed stars. The station's first timetable listed 33 arrivals and 33 departures daily. What people found here was more than transit. It was travel. It was train. With 16 tracks, Union Station quickly became a hub for citizens and stars alike. Union Station saw heavy use during World War II when troops were mobilized, as there were nearly 30,000 travelers who passed through Union Station daily. After the war, many soldiers returned from battle by train and were reunited with their families at Union Station. Trains were not only reliable, they were romanced. In those days, trains had names like Sunset Limited and the Super Chief, the big, powerful liner that coupled the coasts from Los Angeles to New York. Union Station also served as a popular location for filming and has been featured in movies such as Blade Runner, Dead Men Don't Wear Plaid, In the Mood, and Union Station starring William Holden and Nancy Olsen. Today, Union Station is completely revived. There are over 60,000 travelers who walk through the station daily and it continues to undergo historical restoration. From all of us here at Metrolink to the Grand LA Union Station, happy 75th birthday. Here's to the next 75. Hi, my name's Louie and I'm at Pan Pacific Park and you're watching LA City V35. It's our city, it's our channel. In LA this week. These workers demanding higher wages and union rights on the death anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm Gil Reyes in downtown with a story. I'm Anna Margos, an LA firefighter shot in the carotid artery during the Rodney King riots, but he survived. His harrowing story, 25 years later. I'm Rasha Goel, up next, an opportunity to walk through some of downtown LA's treasures. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yana Kay. Most of us will never forget the experience of watching our City of Angels burning in the wake of the civil unrest of 1992. Now on the 25th anniversary of the riots, one LA firefighter remembers his close brush with death. Anna Marcos has the story. The first day of the Rodney King riots, 1992. A South LA crowd riled up after four LAPD officers were found not guilty in the beating of African-American parolee Rodney King. One LA firefighter crew was on its way to putting out the fires exploding all over the city. Driving down the 110 freeway, we could see just multiple columns of smoke and buildings on fire. Then the unthinkable happened as a driver approached the fire truck. The car zoomed up, put his hand out, pulled the trigger of the gun, so then I said, Scott's been shot. The bullet came across, followed across my jawbone, 
went into my neck and severed my carotid artery. When it severed my carotid artery, I had a stroke and I was paralyzed at that point. The quick thinking and first aid skills of his crew got Captain Scott Miller to the hospital in time to save him. But this was the first of many hard lessons for firefighters in the coming days. We received uh, uh, bottles and rocks that were thrown at the engine. For the first time in my career, I thought, well, I wonder if this person's going to shoot us. We no longer carry equipment on the outside of our fire engines. And I know of one example where they used the pick head of the axe and actually used it and, and uh, hit the top of a uh, battalion command vehicle. And it went through the roof of the car. They could have killed someone. They could have. Captain Miller was hospitalized for weeks and was in physical therapy for two and a half years. When he returned to work six months later, he realized he would never recover enough to get back on the front lines. Still, he considered himself lucky. I have a grandchild that I've been able to watch grow up, and that all just is, is the fruits of having a good day. Miller gets emotional as he counts the good things. He will never have full use of his left arm again, but he now works in fire prevention. And the department has made changes. Crews wear armored vests on dangerous calls. They've changed their engine formations, and engine cabs are now covered. This is one battle-hardened fire department that's better prepared if civil unrest ever occurs again. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. By the way, the suspect who shot Captain Miller was caught and sent to jail. Turning now to workers' wages. Could you survive on $10.50 an hour? Well, that's the current minimum wage in L.A., and though raises are coming, workers who handle our food say they're not happening fast enough. Gil Reyes has more. Fast food workers march through downtown, demanding higher pay. From places to McDonald's, Burger King, El Pollo Loco, anything you can think of fast food, basically. The workers demanding a $15 an hour minimum wage. They'll get their wish, but it will have to happen slowly over a period of years. Local leaders have set up a gradual wage increase every July to cushion the blow for employers. The gradual increase to the $15 an hour minimum wage has already started, expected to kick in here in Los Angeles in 2020, statewide in 2022. But these workers say that's too far away. No, it's not good enough. We need, we need, we need 15 now. I mean, you have a family. How are you going to take care of your children? How are you going to get uh, health care, things of that nature? So, yes, $15 an hour. We need more than $15 an hour. But right now, we'll fight for the $15 an hour and try to, try to go forward. The march from downtown's financial district to Skid Row coincided with the anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Dr. King had been demonstrating with black sanitation workers for better wages when he was killed. Like those workers in 1968, these fast food workers also want the right to unionize. To this day we don't have 2017. Over 50 percent of black um, workers do not have uh, 15 dollars of minimum wage and over 60 percent of Latino workers don't have 15 dollars the hour. The 15 dollar wage will happen, but for workers struggling to get by, how long can they wait? In downtown L.A., I'm Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. L.A.'s minimum wage jumps to $12 an hour in July. The wage will go up every summer until it reaches $15 an hour in 2020. An update now on the Crenshaw LAX rail line. Crews have added a new rail crossing at Sentinella and Florence as the project inches ever closer to completion. However, people affected by construction raised concerns at a recent meeting. Gil Reyes has more. Construction of Metro's Crenshaw LAX line is causing problems for Marie Bryant and other drivers. People who are living on uh, some of the side streets they are coming home uh, late in the afternoon and they are trying to find place for parking. I can only imagine what's going to happen uh, when the train comes through. Metro officials say parking and other traffic problems related to construction are expected. But will there be enough parking when it's finished? Bryant and others gathered at this community meeting hope so. 
The Crenshaw LAX line will stretch eight and a half miles and will serve the Crenshaw District, Inglewood and Westchester. It's billed as an alternative to driving on LA's congested streets. Teachers at View Park Preparatory School support it. When Metro approached us, we said we're all in because, believe it or not, you know, our students are ultimately going to be using the Metro to get to school. But finding parking remains on Marie Bryant's mind. I'm really excited about the train. Don't get me wrong. I really am. I've always been supportive of that. I think it's something that's needed. But I still have to stress. I know you're uh, channel uh, 35, you said. Uh, and it's the city channel. I'm hoping this will get back to uh, our city elected officials. In Lamert Park, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. The Crenshaw LAX line is expected to be completed in 2019. Over at City Hall, it was a day meant for celebration and recognition. But this year's Trans Day of Visibility served as a reminder that many transgender people feel far from safe in our country. Anna Marcos takes a look. They pray for things that most of us have never had to pray for. Strengthen us and keep us and help us. Oh God, there are forces high and low and some see themselves as mighty who would destroy us, who would continue to perpetuate the environment that leads to our murder. These are the leaders of LA's transgender community. On this Trans Day of Visibility, they stand with city leaders and some of the LAPD's LGBT officers. Together, they're speaking up for the most vulnerable, like the eight trans women murdered in hate crimes countrywide in the last three months alone. China Gibson was killed on February 25th in New Orleans. Jamie Lee Wounded Arrow killed on January 1st in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Misha Caldwell killed on January 4th in Canton, Mississippi. But today is also a day for being counted, for becoming visible to the world, and for fighting injustice in an unfriendly political climate. Recently, we learned that Donald Trump eliminated sexual orientation identity from the 2020 census, denying us the funding for critical support services. I uh, identify as a transgender man. My pronouns are he, him, his, and that's how I like to be recognized. This is not a day of mourning. This is a day of visibility. This is a day of recognition. This is a day of empowerment. These activists are part of LA's Transgender Advisory Council, one of the first permanent transgender councils in the country. And they advise city leaders on HIV and health care, job and housing discrimination, and other issues that affect the transgender community. The primary scary experience that I have faced has not been one of violence, but one where I have not been protected on my job. And so when a corporation found out that I was a trans woman, I was instantly terminated. Oftentimes, we are left out of the conversation and we are not at the table when decisions are being made on our behalf. These things all add to almost erasing our humanity. I hope this night will, nightmare will be over soon and we can all achieve our constitutional and God-given right for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Thank you. For these activists, those rights have to start with speaking your truth. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. The Trans Day of Visibility is honored in countries around the world. Well, for many of us, the weekend may be a time for some R&R, &R, but not for one community. Hyde Park residents and fellow Angelinos came out to get their hands dirty for a clean cause. Rasha Goel has more. Rakes, brooms, shovels, and some helping hands were all on board to help clean up the Hyde Park neighborhood. We will be going up and down Hyde Park Boulevard between 11th Avenue and Venez Avenue, um, cleaning up all of the weeds, bulky items, trash, uh, any issues that we have on the railroad tracks. It's an area the district has received a lot of complaints about. In addition to beautifying the area, it's also a chance to interact with neighbors. What we're trying to do is give up, give people an opportunity 
opportunity to meet each other, to work shoulder to shoulder, uh, to get to see your neighborhood. It's very different than driving through your neighborhood than it is walking block to block. Various community groups also came out to help. It's something that we have to do as a community, uh, try to make our city as beautiful as possible with the help of the, the youth. No job at this cleanup is too small. Little by little, but large enough to make an impact. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Think it's too late to earn a high school diploma? Well, think again. The LA City Library offers free accredited classes online for working adults. Gil Reyes has more from a different kind of graduation ceremony. She finally did it. After dropping out of high school years ago, Valeria Siriani took advantage of a second chance and finally earned her high school diploma. It was something really amazing. It was like a whole new experience. Congratulations go out to 30 unique graduating students. Their ages range between 20 and 55. The latest to graduate from the LA City Library's career online high school program. It allows people who, for some reason or another, didn't finish traditional high school to finally earn their diplomas at their own time. And oftentimes in between work. Take the case of class valedictorian and library employee Samson Rodriguez feeling out of place in traditional high school after immigrating from Mexico, he too had dropped out years ago. There was a lot of pressure and there was humiliation too when I would get called out or bullied um, at a young age for not knowing certain simple things. So I like career online high school because it was simple. I did it from home. Graduate Claudine Verdier discovered her high school credits in her native Belize could not transfer over to the U.S. So she too enrolled in the program and is now trying to convince her son, a dropout, to do the same. I just say, I'm just going to do the whole high school over. And I showed him, I could do it, you could do it. The LA City Library is the first library system in the nation to offer these courses. It's an incredible program and a great example of how the library really changes lives. These individuals now with their high school diploma are uh, able to get better jobs and uh, more opportunities in higher education. So I'm currently in school, I'm getting my bachelor's and I'm going to be going to chiropractic school too as soon as I'm done. Nice. I go to Pasadena City College. Yeah, I'm working for my associates for nursing. If you think you're scared uh, or you think it's too hard or you think it's not right for you, just do it. I mean, what do you have to lose? Nothing, of course, because online classes are free. At Career Online High School Graduation, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Interested in enrolling? Well, check out the website lapl.org slash cohs. Well, it's a reminder of the lessons learned from the Rodney King riots. 25 years later, art helps us to give us perspective as the reimagined justice exhibit opens in South L.A. Night begins to fall and the intersection is burning. Another man who was beaten staggers up as a black preacher seems to pray over him. The Rodney King riots marked their 25th anniversary this month, and the Office of Community Coalition, a social justice group formed after the riots, has turned its entire office into a living art exhibit for the month. It sits less than a mile from where the riots started in South L.A. The reimagined justice exhibit focuses on the civil unrest and looting, which started after LAPD officers were found not guilty in the beating of Rodney King. The riots then spread to other parts of the city. It really marks a time for us to uh, take a moment to pause uh, and really think about and reflect around uh, you know, what has really changed uh, 25, uh, 25 years later. Learn about uh, the roots that led up to the civil unrest. Uh, also talk about uh, what are some of the conditions that folks are facing today. Photographs, art, live performances and media all give a glimpse into different people's experiences of the riots. Over 50 artists and their teams are taking part and many of them are from South LA. It was really powerful in putting this show together, how many people came uh, who brought their personal artifacts, people's original photographs that have never been seen before. Among those never before seen photos is the work of photographer Abraham Torres. That night, I, we didn't realize that we're driving into the riot. 
The riot had begun that night. These pictures are incredibly rare. The future of our city really depends on how much progress we can bring to communities like South Los Angeles that have a history of neglect and disinvestment. There's a way of being cathartic about the experience because everybody who was in L.A. during that time knows exactly where they were during the riots and has a story to tell. And the exhibits allow plenty of room for both catharsis and reflection on how we can bring progress to a long impoverished area. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. For more information, visit CocoSouthLA.org forward slash L.A. Uprising. Police and firefighters shave it all off to raise money for cancer research. Gil Reyes shows us what all the buzz is about on St. Baldrick's Day. A nice full head of hair on both L.A. City Fire Captain Danny Wu and LAPD Lieutenant Greg Doyle. But not for long. And it's all for a good cause. Fifteen years ago, when my son had cancer, I started to, I joined up with the fire department. Uh, the captain at this station was doing an event, and, uh, and he let me join in very graciously. And ever since then, it's taken off. So over the years, we've raised over a million dollars for the St. Baldrick's Foundation. The yearly St. Baldrick's Day event at North Hollywood Fire Station raises money for child cancer research. People shave their heads in solidarity. A show of support for loved ones who bravely endured pain and loss of hair from chemotherapy. Maggie Ownby lost a family member to cancer in February. I did this for Eileen and her memory and her loving memory. And I'm doing it also for the honored kids. I met a wonderful kid today named Angel. And it just touched my heart so much. This year our goal is $100,000 and we're pretty confident we're going to reach that. But uh, just to be sure, I encouraged everybody to get out, out here this morning and to help us uh, reach our goal. Every three minutes around the world, a child is diagnosed with cancer. People gladly losing their locks in hopes of one day finding a cure. In North Hollywood, I'm Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Officials at the fire department say they surpassed their $100,000 fundraising goal. Well, plenty of hair was also being cut over at a Woodland Hill school as kids cut their ponytails for cancer victims. Anna Marcos has more from the annual Pony Up Cutathon. Lots and lots of ponytails everywhere. There's blonde ones, long ones, there's twin ponytails, multiple ponytails, and more, as dozens of students, even parents and teachers, prep their hair for the fourth annual Pony Up Cutathon. I'm going to miss it, like, uh, probably, like, for the first minute, and then I'll probably get over it. I'm cutting my hair. I want to give them to the person who don't have any hair. One of my um, family members has cancer, and they're fighting it right now. So I feel bad. Well, I want um, them to feel happy that they don't feel out like they don't have hair. So I want to give them my hair so they feel happy. The cutathon at Serenia Charter Elementary School in Woodland Hills helps collect hair for cancer survivors who have lost their hair after going through chemotherapy. Yvette Peterson, a two-time cancer survivor, started the event. When you look into the mirror and see yourself bald, it's such a, such a significant reminder that you're sick and you don't feel whole. What's really powerful about that is not just the hair that people are cutting off so it can be made into a wig, but that tremendous act of kindness. A snip of the scissors and there they go, donating anywhere from eight inches to a foot of their hair. It takes hair from about six volunteers to make a wig. I feel so good. Well, I thought about it, but I wasn't quite brave enough to cut my hair. However, I am lending support with a little Pony Up beanie. Oh my, there's even some styling going on. Now I really wish I would have done it. This little boy did. I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. By the way, you can cut your hair and donate it to the cause anytime. To find out how, visit Pantene.com and click on the link Beautiful Lengths. A Dudley intersection in West Hills gets a safety upgrade. Councilmember Mitch Englander kicks off his film festival for young filmmakers. And kids in West L.A. have a new place to play. All these stories in City Beat. 
Councilmember Mitchell Englander joined Los Angeles Department of Transportation and community members to activate a pedestrian warning device at the Jason and Roscoe intersection in West Hills. The project's undertaking comes after a mother, her daughter and their family dog were struck and killed while crossing the street in the marked but uncontrolled crosswalk. Officials say the Jason and Roscoe pedestrian warning device project combines two overhead flashing beacons with pedestrian controls and in-road flashing LEDs to vastly improve visibility of those crossing the intersection, especially at night. Englander also kicked off his second annual Movies That Matter Youth Short Film Festival, which is open to young filmmakers from elementary, middle, high school and college campuses throughout Council District 12 and the San Fernando Valley. Participants will be using the themes of social action and civic engagement to channel their creative process in one of four categories, public service announcement, documentary, live action and animation. For more information or to submit, visit cd12movies.com. The Department of Recreation and Parks, along with Councilmember Paul Caret, celebrated the reopening of the playground at Cheviot Hills Recreation Center located in West L.A. Cheviot Hills Park serves nearly 6,000 residents who are within walking distance. The newly installed playground was designed with a treehouse-themed play area featuring a hollowed-out sycamore tree piece with multiple stumps that children can play on. The play equipment includes two bays of swings, two belts and two tot seats and a tire swing. For more fun, you know, more up-to-date, uh, and I think uh, this will be a great place for kids. Well, you probably think you've seen all there is to see in L.A., right? Well, you'd be wrong. A new experience is highlighting some of L.A.'s hidden gems while making the old look new again. Rasha Goel has more as the Center Theatre Group recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. It's an opportunity to explore the sights and sounds of downtown L.A. Remote L.A., put on by the Center Theatre Group, is celebrating its 50th season at the Mark Taper Forum. This walking performance tour gives people a unique way to learn about themselves, people around them, and the city. You walk next to others, but how close do you want them to be? How close do you want to be to your neighbor? Remote LA isn't your average tour. Through a computer-generated recording, you are guided through the city in real time, and not just as a spectator, but also as a participant. The performance reveals an unseen L.A., places where people explore their limits and see common places. It's a creative way of seeing the city while understanding how you perceive things. I thought it might be a great way to see places that I don't usually have access to in the city and to do so with other people, meet new people, interact with them, and new spaces at the same time. I know L.A. fairly well, and I've lived in the area for a long time, but it just seemed a, a really unusual way to encounter downtown. From the inside of Union Station to the outside of Pershing Square, visitors are able to capture the historic sites of downtown LA without a detailed narrative. Downstairs walk along the platform. Don't enter any train before I tell you to do so. I feel like everyone kind of has an idea of what LA is, so maybe this will give like a new perspective. A new way of seeing an old city. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Center Theatre Group is one of LA's leading nonprofit theatre companies. Well, if you love modern art, you may want to check out the new exhibit at Art and Practice. Enjoy an Earth Day celebration that's perfect for the whole family, and some seniors go all out for a talent show in Sherman Oaks. All this in this week's Things to Do. Art and Practice presents a solo exhibition of artworks by artist Al Loving. For 40 years, Loving experimented with materials and process to expand the definition of modern painting, drawing on everything from free jazz to his family's quilting tradition. In the 1980s, Loving broke free of that flat image, using heavy rag paper to make three-dimensional collages in brilliant colors. At AMP, Spiral Play will feature 12 of these collages, some of them monumental in scale. The work is radical, beautiful, and deeply human. His work will be on display at Art and Practice at 3401 West 43rd Place in Lamert Park from April 22nd through July 29th. 
To learn more, visit artandpractice.org. Join LA Sanitation for the annual Citywide LA Sanitation Earth Day LA 2017 Festival. There will be over 50 exhibits dedicated to promoting sustainability and environmentally friendly activities, including city vehicles to explore, seed planting, and mulch giveaways. Entertainment will also be on hand, including performances from Tommy the Clown and other musical acts. The event takes place Saturday, April 22nd at Exposition Park, South Lawn, near the Metro Expo Line. For more, visit LACitySan.org. Unleash your artistic talents during the Spring 2017 Senior Amateur Talent Show. Join the fun or just come watch a variety of individual and group performances of singing, dancing, spoken word, and comedy. If you've ever wanted to show off your talents, this is the perfect opportunity. Admission is free and all ages are welcome. It all takes place at the Sherman Oaks East Valley Adult Center at 5056 Van Nuys Boulevard. For more information, call 818-386-9674. And that's a look at some things to do. Well, that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kane from all of us here at LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week. and I'm in Little Tokyo, and you're watching Channel 35, Your City, Your Channel. Are you looking for a new pet? Well, if you are, this is the show for you. It's time for Adopt a Pet Today, sponsored by the Pet Care Foundation. And today, we are at the South LA Shelter on 60th Street, just off Western. And if that's not a convenient location for you, you can find out where all six LA Animal Services shelters are at laanimalservices.com. That's laanimalservices.com. Now you'll find out all the locations there. You can see every single animal they have at all six locations. And there's just a wealth of information about animal care and animal behavior and all the other ways that you can help save a pet if you're so inclined and we hope you are. Today's a special day because we have Brenda Barnett, General Manager of LA Animal Services, and we're gonna talk to her about what's going on with all the shelters in all of LA City. So let's get started, and we're gonna see Raina and Sally and lots of great dogs and lots of great cats, one that'll be perfect just for you. So let's go say hello to Brenda and find out what's going on with LA Animal Services. So now I'm here with Brenda Barnett and this little beauty. We're calling her Babs, and her impound number is A1691133. She's a little m female. She's only seven months old. What do you think about this little girl, Brenda? I think she's really nice. She's a little bit shy, so she needs someone who will teach her some tricks, build the confidence. But at seven months old, she should be pretty easy to house train. Yeah. They have a little bit more bladder control. She's not real mouthy. She's very, very friendly. She's a sweet girl. She's very sweet. And she's she's a puppy, but she she's is. more of a low-key yeah. puppy. And she's the right size. She's got short legs and a long body, yeah. so she 
it. So the jumping up is not going to be quite as much. Uh, maybe even potentially a kid's dog uh, because she, yeah. she is short she and won't jump a lot. Too. Yes. What yes. do you think she is? Well, I think she's really a dog, but I think she might be a mixed corgi. <laughs> you don't think she's a cat? <laughs> I'm pretty sure pretty she's not a, not a cat. cat. <laughs> Definitely not a bunny rabbit. <laughs> right. No, no hopping. She's very sweet. And if you want to see her, she's here at the South LA Shelter. Again, her number is A169. 1133. It says here she's a terrier mix. She's just a small brown dog. <laughs> so she, she, she's a small brown dog and she's terrific. Yeah. yeah. She'd be a great companion for you. Yeah. Probably right. for your kids to. Little song dies. Your kids aren't too rough with her. Yeah. You know, you need to teach them to be compassionate and not jump on them and pull at them too much. But tell us a little bit what's going on with LA Animal Services these days. Well, it's a very exciting time for us. We're uh, approaching a 90% life save rate, expect to be there by the end of 2017. Right. And now we're working on not just getting there, but making sure once we do, we can sustain it. Because that's the important thing. Is 90% considered a no-kill city? Or? It is. Uh, usually there are at least 10% of the animals who come in or who are gravely injured, can't be Say right. sometimes you get animals who are just too dangerous to be turned loose within the community. Right. So 90% is good. Doesn't mean we won't try to go higher. <laughs> that would be great. The higher you can get, the better. Yes. And yes. that leads me to uh, uh, just explain a little bit about what what is NKLA. Okay, No Kill LA is sort of an acronym that uh, came up when we first started our partnership with Best Friends. Mm -hmm. We uh, we Best Friends was able to get a very high uh, profile marketing company to work with us on names because we weren't sure should we use no kill should we use another term and after the marketing company did a national search and looked at what was going on they said you know it really explains it better than anything even yeah. though we do have to explain that 10 percent right. it explains it better than anything so right. the people who are members of no NKLA are um, people who are groups who are New Hope partners with the city and also registered with NKLA with Best Friends. And Pet Care Foundation is is a member too. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Uh, there's stuff that's going on here at the South LA Shelter that's new and exciting. Yeah, you know, this is one of our most exciting shelters. People don't always know it. People don't always come down here because it's far away. Right. But this is our largest shelter. Uh, we just, our Board of Animal Services Commissioners just let us bring in UC Davis uh, Shelter Medicine Program to do a consult on what, how we can do more, better for cats. That's we're great. making some changes around, as you know. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're moving the bunnies around to try to make it better for them. Uh, even though this is a new facility, we're still trying to improve and, and get better. And honestly, if I was looking for a great little dog, I'd head on down to South LA. They always have, I always say, there's uh -huh. never a shortage of right. cute little dogs here at South LA. Yeah. You know, and it's it's a little bit of a trek if you don't live down here, but it's worth it. It's you know? real, really worth it. The staff here is terrific. It's a big shelter. There's a lot of variety of dogs of all sizes, right. age cats, kittens, bunnies, I mean, you name it, and uh, South LA is a great place to come and, and meet fantastic shelter animals. It's true. And if you can adopt, what can people do? Well, thank you for asking that. Fostering. Temporary foster care is the best lifesaver I know. If you have animals for, if you can take them for three or four days, two weeks, two months, whatever you're able yeah. to do will adjust your schedule. Whether it's kittens, uh, I would not start with bottle babies. I would start with kittens and puppies right. that are already that eating. Already Sometimes yeah. you get the mother with them. Sometimes just an adult dog in the shelter who's being over overlooked or, or an adult cat because right. it's kitten season or puppy season, they're, they're being overlooked, they're languishing in the back, get them out, take them, walk them in your neighborhood, show them, them to your friends, get yeah. them socialized, and give them a little home care. I mean, whatever people can do, whatever yeah. amount of foster care, it really is, gives animals a new chance at life. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So go to the website, laanimalservices.com, see how to foster, how to volunteer, and help save a life. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. And thank Pet Care Foundation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Babs. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to go home with you. I would love it. <laughs> Raina, you have Dottie. I have Dottie. Is and she a cutie? So cute. <laughs> yeah. She's about three years old. She's been here for about three months. 
Um, she's I, I, she's just darling. She is so cute and nice, not overly large. Nope. Um, good size and still active and energetic. How old is she now? Three. Three. So About. it's a good. She's past the puppy phase, but yes. still full of it. So it's a you know she's a staffy mix and and, and, and she's mix. doing pretty well right now. Yeah. She's kind of just standing here taking it all in. She is. So and it out. let me give you her A number. Okay. One six seven four zero three eight. She's at South Central. Uh, three year old uh, staffy mix. Uh, and her name is Dottie, but it could be something else. Yes. Come see Dottie, vaccinated, microchipped, and sterilized. Very important. Ready to go home. Awesome girl. Uh, oh. Raina has Rex. Rex is 11 years old, Raina. He was turned in by his owners because he's got, he's old and has some medical issues. And they had him. How do you turn in an 11 year old dog? And evidently the medical issues were pretty minor, yes. you know, nothing really serious, and, you know, um, arthritis happens. Uh, yes. And yet I didn't see any him exhibiting any, he moved out here just fine. You he's, know? he's housebroken, he gets along with men, women, children, and other dogs, he's not real fond of cats. His A number is 1682965. Talk about an easy dog. Easy. Seniors, they just touch my heart. Yes. I have one, I have an 11 year old myself, and people are amazed they wouldn't know he's 11 anyway it's how you care for them and right. what you do with them just like with us if we're active and eat right and take care of ourselves that we'll be fine too and so is my dog and yeah. this guy seems fine there's supplements for arthritis that's minor evidently they say he can hear and see fine he, you know, he's active he's a good boy and the nice thing about Rex he's used to a family this would be a dog you could meet fairly easily oh, yeah he walked. we've never met him before no, no. He walked just right up walked right up and says hi I'm here you know so he's gonna be you know easy to in, in the home and integrate into the home and just be a great a great friend you know and some people go I don't want a dog for a short period of time you know what there are those people out there who are willing to give a dog a home for that last five six years whatever it may be for him you Could know? Be. and and that's great absolutely know? That's great. a one six eight two nine six five this is Rex, 11 years old, 11 years young, I'd say. 11 years young. Yeah, 11 yeah. years young. Hi, gorgeous. He's gorgeous. Yes, you are. What do you think? Got your bandana? Yay. Uh, this is Goosey. He is. He this, is darling. He's three Hello, years old. Goosey. Hey. Hi. Come see me. Good. Are you nervous about the blowers out there? He was yeah. upset about the gardeners yeah. a little bit. Hi, now they went away, relaxed a little bit. And dogs do get upset with yeah. things like that, don't they? They do. And the guy hadn't even blown anything yet. It was just the visual. They know what it is, right. you know. And there's right. a lot of clients I have who don't like gardeners, poolmen, that sort of thing, because they invade their space and the noise may scare them. Exactly. But uh, him he's now. okay now. He's no. okay. His number okay. is A1682092. He's about three years old. You're okay. Uh, he's been here since February 19th. His name's Goosey. He came out feeling pretty confident and he comfortable. Did. He did. Walked right up to us and happy. Yeah. Um, he was a stray, I guess. Stray. And nobody claimed him. Um, his ears, as you can see, have been really, really cut back. Badly. Badly. Yeah. And um, uh, how does that affect them? I mean, is it? Well. They kind of, they don't know any more okay. about it, okay. I, I, but the thing is, health-wise, they get infections a lot more, oh. dirt, get, debris gets in there a and lot more. sunburn? Sunburn, all that, because they're all exposed now, there's okay. no protection, okay. and um, and of course, it's not done very well, you yeah. know, some, some people do backyard clipping, oh, you know, okay. and it's really sad to see. You know, if you're going to do it, do it right, but you know, I'm not all for that anyway, but he's a, he's a good boy. He's and, vaccinated? Um, he's, a neutered, neutered and ready to go. microchipped. Yeah, hi. And look at how well he calmed down. Yeah, he did. He did a he good job. You did a he good did. job, Goose. Yeah, you did. Good job, big guy. A, one six eight two zero nine two. This is Goosey. Good boy. Raina is uh, taking care of King here. He came out kind of excited, but now Raina, with her nice touch, is saying, King, everything's okay. You can chill. And he can chill with other people, too, right? I love his size and coloring. Oh, yeah. That, you know, a lot of stimulus here, passing dogs, you know, and coming out into the yard. The cameras and all, but, you know, he's he's a favorite here, and he's he's another stray. He's a good size, pretty coloring. What Beautiful a color. Beautiful color. Yeah. King. He's, he's two years old. His A number is 
seven seven eight four. Hi. He's yeah. tan and tan. Tan and tan. You're gorgeous. Yeah, you're a gorgeous you king. Two yeah. years old, South Central, uh, neutered, microchip, vaccinated. Ready to go. All the dogs are before they go home. King has some energy. He might be a good running partner. Running partner, agility, get him, get him. Oh, agility. You know, get these dogs. You know, training is so important. Uh, you know, when you acclimate, oh, I'm thirsty. I see Bill with some water. Yay. Uh, man, oh, my Bill, goodness. I might even play in it. Oh, oh thank you, good Bill. Job. That's what I wanted, water. Dogs need kind of a job. <laughs> And, and that could be agility, it oh, could yeah. be uh, going after a ball, fetching, a job. Give them some work to Give do. Give them mental stimulus. Mental, There's even yes. just, you know, puzzle toys, food dispensing toys that, you know, I'm going to you know, introduce to a client today whose dog needs some mental stimulus because yeah. he's been injured. The dog was injured and can't move around much, gotcha. so he needs gotcha. other stimulus. Dogs need this stuff, you know. So this is King, A168-7784. He's young, two years. Years cute. old, cute, great ears. You got great Hi. ears and a great Yay. tail. Oh, he yeah. said, and I can calm down too. Yes, I, can. I can. I just wanted water. I bet he'd be a pool dog. Uh, I'm bet? thinking so. <laughs> if it was bigger, he'd be in it. Yeah, I got yeah. it. Right. Okay, so this is Cookie. That's actually a female. Ah. And her A number is 169-0633. She's a little nervous. She is. She's so a little nervous. So meeting her would require quiet. Yes, and actually, you know... <sighs> Meeting dogs, they're all different, right? They all right. have different personalities like us. Right. They all have different mm, fears. Some are outgoing, some are friendly, some are cautious, some are more selective. So you don't know when you're approaching somebody who has a dog what that dog's about, right? Okay. okay. So one of the things that's really annoying for most of us trainers is the way people want to approach and meet dogs is very invasive, really. Of their space. Of their space. They're always, oh, I'll let him sniff my hand, you know, uh -huh. so they lean forward, reach out, and they're approaching the dog by by broaching their personal space by sticking their hand gotcha. or their body bending over. And the thing is, you can't do that. It's really about I go into I go into hundreds of homes, you know, and I am never approaching a dog. The yeah, dog has to come to me. Awesome. The dog awesome. has to approach me. And that gives me an idea of who the dog is anyway. Right. You know? Right. It may take him 10 minutes. He may do it right away. Or he may not do it at all. But the point being is it's his choice. Right. And then I kind of know what he's about. Right. You know? Um, once they do approach, what is their demeanor? Right. Are they just sniffing cautiously or are they going hi yeah. <laughs> I yeah, right. see you pet yes. me pet me right. so their demeanor is very important too you know it doesn't mean because they're approaching they're saying pet me they may just want to yeah. check you out so you really you know have to understand and ask the owner can't because my clients tell me this all the time they have fearful dogs or reactive dogs and, and they have these cuties on the leash and people are walking up to them right, and my right. clients go no 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 my dog no he doesn't like it. Oh, oh but I like dogs yeah. I'm okay and that's going to make a difference and that's going to no. make it no. and they end up you know not having a good experience so you know you really have to respect what the owner says you have to really understand you know, it's not your place to just start approaching and reaching for dogs that you don't know. So when you go to this shelter and they bring out a dog like Cookie, who's about two years old. I, again, uh, do not invade their space. Right, let I them come up to you. Let them come up to you. Let the dog come up. Let them check you out. Uh, take that time to get to know the dog a little bit and see what it's doing. Um, a lot of people just are very invasive, you know, and, and overwhelming to a dog. And it's, it's it can be overwhelming here anyway. You know, they're... Oh, a yeah. Uh -oh, what a was little that? noise. A what little noise. It scared her a little bit. Scared yeah. you. But she's doing good. okay. So you got a tail down, and she's a little cautious, but um, she, she actually settled she in did. okay. She did okay. Her A number is 169-0633. She's yes. saying, you smell like dog, Raina, and maybe food. Yes. I'll come over and hi. say hi to hi. you. I'll say, 
If you are going to have a dog approach, sometimes with small ones getting down low and always being sideways is best. Yes. Not, not staring frontal, there. Yes. Not frontal. So right. I, if a large dog is walking towards me, I stand sideways and I it's not as confrontational, you right. know, and, and you're more at an oblique angle and not looking at them. And, and she's uh, saying, I'd like to smell yeah. you, Raina. I want to know who you are. I could be a good, I could be your best friend. She's at South Central. Her name is Cookie, A169-0633. She's about two years old. She could be a good friend for you. She is darling. And she was she was carried in, so she likes to be a lap dog, yes. you know, obviously. So she's a cuddler. Raina has Jonah. His A number is 169-1089. Jonah's only been here for a couple of weeks, so this is a whole new environment. I lived in a house. The landlord said, no, I can't live in this house. So now I'm at the shelter, and I don't know where I am or what I'm doing and who all these people are. No, and he, yeah, and he's gorgeous. Oh, my God, he's gorgeous. He's, draw, he's a big, strong boy, Jonah. You're okay. But he's a little little overwhelmed, you know, yeah. coming out. Hello, beauty. Hello. And so he's nervous. I saw by his tail when he came out, and he's like, you know, a little overwhelmed, and that's normal, but they can get past that. Yes. You yes. know, get some help and get some training and get, hey, you, come here. You're okay. Do, do, do. He said, but it yeah. smells so good, and, uh -huh. and, and I want to yeah. smell. And he's, he's going to be neutered before he goes. He hasn't been neutered yet, okay. and that is also part of his distraction. You right, know, right, all right. the smells of the other dogs, they get very aroused and interested, huh? But, you but are actually, so he's beautiful. kind of calm. He's calming down. And he's relaxing himself yeah. by panting, panting a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My A number is 169-1089. I'm a gorgeous dog. I will be neutered, vaccinated, and microchipped. And ready to when go. you take me home because I am handsome. My name right now is Jonah. I, I like am your name. Such a guy. I'm uh, three years old. Good job, Jonah. So this Whoa. is Bear. He's Hello. been at the shelter for about three months. Totally yeah. different dog. Oh, totally different from but, Jonah. From Jonah, but he's also been here longer. longer. And he's kind of settled into his new home. And he may just have a different personality anyway, exactly. right? Exactly. They all have their own? Didn't we? Yeah. They're all different about how they acclimate to their environment and and people. And this boy came out tail wagging, whole different body language than Jonah. Jonah settled in. He did fine, but he just takes a little longer, right? Right. right. Hey, can you turn around and look? Yeah. <laughs> there you are. Bear Good. is his name. And, and, and whack, 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 whack. That's his tail. That's his and tail. his number is A167663366. Just keep time to the music there, yeah. Bear. <laughs> Just, uh, uh -oh. he's happy, no, go lucky. Here. He Stay said, here. I like you. I'm good here. Um, I'm a strong boy. Hi. He likes he's a to boy. fetch. He's, he's a does? fetcher. And he gets along evidently with other dogs and, and he's, <laughs> he's just a social boy. Uh, he's just a, a so social you'll boy. have to keep things on the tables, <laughs> off the tables, because he'll <laughs> knock them off the tables. That tail's just going. He oh. said, I'm neutered, I'm microchipped, I'm vaccinated. My number's A167-6636. Oh. And I am just one happy guy. You ready to go, huh? I'm ready. You ready for a home? I'd Good like job. to play fetch. Good boy. Bear, I love it. Bear. He looks like a bear. He's a bear. Yeah, I'm a bear. Hi, bear. Oh, yeah, you're a kisser, too. I'm here with Diana. We're in the cat room. And Diana, tell me about this girl. So this is... is this is a girl. This is a female. Her name is Velvet. She is a black, long-haired domestic. Um, I call her a cave dweller because she likes to figure out a way to hide either, whether it's under a blanket, under the newspaper, as you can see. Uh, she likes to be hidden. Okay. They love to bury and find those tents and caves and whatever to hide. Correct. Them. She especially does so. Yes, we can. Here. So she's really cute. We were peeking at her before and she goes, hello, how are you? Hi, there she is. Yes, so this is her in her little cave dwelling here. I did try and get her to come out and made her a little cave, but she decided she prefers the newspaper and there she goes again. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, so she is social at times. She wants to come forward and, and engage and be loved. Right, she definitely is very social. If I completely take her out, if I take this paper out completely, um, she, after a few minutes, she will come out and just start loving on everybody. But then the minute you put the paper in and leave her alone, she goes back to hiding. 
Ah, oh, bless her heart. Trying to look for now. <laughs> okay. Well, this this is Velvet, and she is um, six years old, seven years old, and uh, she is ready to go. She was available March twenty first, and her A number is one six eight four nine four eight. Bless her heart, and um, that's so cute. There's dogs that do that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they burrow, and you know, doxies are real famous for that and they love to burrow and hide and they have their blankies to do that so cats they do the same thing that doesn't mean I don't want to be held and loved come see velvet cutie pie okay and here we are with Marley oh look at Marley says look at me I am a happy happy boy and I'm showing off tell me about Marley Diana so Marley is an owner surrender. The owner could not keep it due to losing their home, unfortunately. So we took him in. He is already neutered. He is ready to go, and he is super, super sweet. Yeah, I can see that. He's showing off. He's a sweetheart. Come see Marley. His A number is 168-9264, and he is only about four years old, three years old, and um, long life yet, ready to go. Yeah. Be great. Hi, sweetie. Good job. Here we go. Look at this baby. Now, she is so tiny, but she's three years old. She doesn't have a name yet, so you can name this beautiful girl. She's a black, domestic short-haired. We've seen a lot of black cats here today, and I love black cats. I'm telling you, I love them. But they, you know, they fall into the wrong hands and get overlooked too much like the black dogs. Tell me about this little girl. So she is very sweet. Uh, she's a black cat, so she's got her basic black cat temperament. All of a sudden, she can be in the corner, and then next minute, she's just the way she is, completely lovable and um, happy. So she's... Look at those eyes. Yeah, she is. She's got very big, bright eyes, yes. Um, she, she tends to get a little bit nervous at first sight sometimes, um, but once she gets accustomed and, and used to anybody and she's ready to be pet, this is, this is her personality here. <laughs> She's showing off for the camera, that's yeah. for sure. Not intimidated there, and she's purring. I can feel that purr going on. What a cutie pie. So come get this girl. She doesn't have a name yet. Her A number is 169-0612, and she's, she's fabulous. Well, here we are with this gorgeous, gorgeous girl. Let me get her info here. Yeah, tell us about it. This, she doesn't have a name. He's, he's a neutered male, oh, actually. Yes, yeah, about one year old. He has no name. He is already available for adoption. Um, and he's ready to go. He's, I think he has some sort of a bit of a Siamese mix in there um, because he's got that basic Siamese type of temperament. Um, and, say, and tell us what that means. What, do you, what does that so, mean? Siamese tend to be a lot, um, they're picky. They will only let you pet them when they feel like being pet. Um, and when they want to be left alone, they'll definitely let you know. Um, so, yeah, so they like to kind of be on their own, either that or they're completely up in your face. So it's either one or the other with them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're somewhat selective about um, when they want to engage and not and on their terms. And they can be vocal as well. They Siamese. Are, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. he's actually got a really sweet low voice. That's the only one I've heard from him so far, but I know they, they tend to have a, quite a few different types yeah. that they can uh, become vocal with. So that little quiet one that he was doing just now, yeah. it, that's his normal one that he's Aww. been using quite often. Sweetheart. Well, he's great. And, you know, to, vive la différence, you know. We're all different. <laughs> we all have different personalities, and this may be the cat for you that's a little more independent and beautiful and still can be a love bug. His number is A1688763. Beautiful blue eyes. Come, come and get this boy and name him. All right, this is Penny, and she is so silly. She was soliciting for all this attention. I opened the door, and she goes, uh-uh, no, I'm going to go over here now on this side. But she is darling. And what, tell us about Penny. So Penny is a spayed female. She is ready to go. She was also an owner surrender. Um, owners uh, couldn't afford her anymore, so they had to bring her in. She is extremely sweet. She loves attention. Um, she likes to rub against the cages and get your attention to, to come on over and pet her up. Yeah, she was doing that, and she was hanging half in, or, in and out of her tunnel between the two darling, darling girl. And her A number is 1652129. Penny is um, a brown tabby and oh, beautiful coloring and <laughs> she goes what is dusty doing with that camera making noise she is darling she is very sweet come see penny come adopt penny and she is only two oh, a year old huh she's a, she's young 
Here we are. Who is this? So this one does not have a name yet, but he is a 12-week-old, already neutered male. He is ready to go. He actually came into us um, with about five other brothers and sisters. There were two males and three, fe uh, three females, I believe. And he's one of the males that um, didn't get adopted over this weekend. Um, and, but he is a hoot. He <laughs> has so much energy. And he just wants you to completely be constantly touching him, holding him, and you walk into the room and he's already at the gate looking for you. I call these dog cats, you know. They just want to be with you so much and engage with you. Hello, gorgeous. Yeah, what do you think? What do you think about this? Kittens have a lot of energy like puppies do. They so do. they require a lot more work and time because they are busy. Yes. So, <laughs> I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I don't necessarily always agree for puppies or dogs this, but I think cats need partners. I, I think kittens, you know, growing up together are, are a great thing. Hello. Yes, at his age right now, he can definitely get along with either an older cat or another cat of his yeah. age. Um, yeah. They're definitely very mobile at this age. Um, so as long as uh, if you have an older cat and they're okay with other cats, um, he's definitely one to, to have a playmate with. Yeah. Keeps them busy yeah. and they occupy their time and play together and it's fun to see. Yes. Yes. He's, he's so energetic. Very loving. Do we get his A number? Oh, his A number is A1690605. And come get this kitty and you can name him whatever you want. Goofball. <laughs> Goofball. <laughs> So that's our show. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Brenda Barnett and all of the staff and volunteers here at the South LA Shelter. Thank you, Raina and Sally, for being here today and helping us, and Dusty and Barbara. Thank you so much for the great show. Now remember, spay and neuter your animals. It's the only way to keep them safe and healthy, and it's the law in the city of LA. Thanks again. See you next time on Adopt a Pet Today. Hi, this is Caratero Family. We are from East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights. You You're watching Channel 35, our city, our channel. The State of the City Address. Please rise for the presentation of the colors by the Los Angeles Police Department Honor Guard and the National Anthem, sung by Police Officer Rosalind Curry. By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the
Maintain standing for the invocation from Imam Jihad Safir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Our Lord, nothing takes place except by your permission. And by your permission only do we gather in the beautiful Los Angeles City Hall for such an awe-inspiring event. Therefore, it is befitting that we beseech you by your holiest of names. al Karim. you are the most generous, and we are lost without your generosity. As-Salam, you are the source of peace, and we are lost without your peaceful presence. Al-Wadud, you are the loving one, and we are lost without your love. Al-Adl, you are the most just, and we are lost without your justice. O oh, possessor of beautiful names, beautify our characters as you have beautified our bodies. O oh, turner of hearts, turn our hearts towards your generosity, peace, love, and justice. Our Lord, with humility, we seek your assistance. I come before you as your servant, as an imam of Islam LA in South Los Angeles. Lord, how can I be a better servant leader? How can I better serve the people of Los Angeles? Oh God, fill our hearts with empathy. Oh God, fill our hearts with love. Oh God, fill our hearts with humility. Our Lord, bring your light to this administration. Guide this administration to their higher selves. Grant this administration hearts that love humanity. Grant this administration hearts that have the capacity to feel with the people. Grant this administration the courage to make amends when they fall into error. Los Angeles is inhabited by beautiful human beings. And we don't always agree, and we don't always worship you the same. Our Lord, bring our hearts together and make us see each other through the eyes of love and compassion. Make us a model city for other cities. Allow our mayor, Eric Garcetti, to build a legacy of love, compassion, and justice. Give our mayor the courage to stand up for what is right, even if he is standing alone. Our beautiful creator makes space in our hearts for the marginalized. Make us be the voice for the voiceless. Allow us to stand with the homeless. Make us of those who build lives instead of destroy lives. And allow us to embrace and assist the returning citizen as he or she attempts to re-enter society. Allow us to welcome our brothers and sisters from all around the world. Exalted is your Lord, the Lord of might, above what they describe, and peace be upon the messengers, and praise belongs to God, the Lord of the worlds. Amen. Los Angeles, you are a beautiful people, there is no place like Los Angeles. Let's get to work and make this the best city in the world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the 42nd mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, please. Please be seated. Council President Wesson, my fellow elected officials and esteemed members of the City Council, the members of the clergy, local leaders, members of the Consular Corps, my family, and especially my wife Amy, who is homesick in bed, our First Lady. I hope you feel better, sweetie. And thank you for all that you do for our city. It is good to be back in these chambers. To everyone gathered here, and to the four million people who call Los Angeles home, it is my honor to be before you again today. Each year, this is a moment of reflection and of commitment to see how far we have come and to chart our way forward in City Hall and everywhere in this city that we call home. Four years ago, we first came together at Exposition Park to discuss the state of our city. And there I laid out a vision for my first term in office. It was time to get back to basics. Time for City Hall to focus on the things that really matter to you as Angelinos. To make sure your hard work is met with opportunity. To make sure your block feels safe to make sure that City Hall does our job every single day to make our city great. Since that first gathering, we have come together every year in Northridge, near our harbor, and now here in City Council Chambers, each time to discuss our progress, to discuss our challenges, and to hold ourselves accountable. For four years, we have worked to improve our city today without losing sight of what we must do to define the Los Angeles of tomorrow. Together, we have delivered more than I ever could have imagined. We raised our minimum wage to $15 an hour. We cut our business tax and slashed our unemployment rate in half. We've paved more roads than at any time in our history, started fixing sidewalks again, and picked up more trash than ever before. We opened up the Broad Museum downtown, landed the Lucas Museum in South LA, the single largest civic gift in history. And not just one, but two NFL teams came home. <laughs> we topped off the tallest building west of the Mississippi, and we are in the finals to bring the Olympics back home to America. These things didn't happen by accident. They happened because we went after them. We built coalitions on the minimum wage, pushed past skeptics on the business tax, cut red tape to speed up construction, and won billions of dollars of federal and state money for our film industry, for our river, our education initiatives, and our transportation projects. We proved that City Hall could focus on the basics and get the job done. But our work will not be measured just by what we do for ourselves today. It will ultimately be remembered for what we leave behind for our children and our grandchildren. That's why after three years of success, we reached for a once in a generation change. And we went to the ballot and we asked the people, are you ready to plan the next 50 years? Are you ready to invest your own resources to meet our most pressing challenges. And you said yes. You voted yes for your future. You voted yes for a city without encampments. You voted yes for a city that fixes its streets and expands its subways. Yes for more affordable housing. Yes for more parks. Yes for better for community colleges. And just as important, you said no to a devastating building moratorium that would have shifted our economy into reverse. Today, Los Angeles, we are thinking big. And these recent elections are a testament to the trust that we have built between the people and City Hall. You told us what you wanted, and together we delivered. 
But these votes weren't just about what we want. They were about who we are. They're not just about what we aspire to, but what we believe in. That this city needs to work for everyone in every community. So, what is the state of our city today? The state of our city is undeniably strong. Record jobs, record investment, record construction, record visitors, record trade, record IPOs, returning industries, nation-leading infrastructure programs, and world-leading innovations. All of these things together are ushering in a transformational decade for our city. But the state of our city isn't just about economic successes. Our strength comes from the values that we hold and the progress that we embody. At a moment like this, the work that we're doing here in Los Angeles is especially urgent. At a moment when the national conversation is anxious and divided, when our infrastructure is crumbling and the future feels uncertain, when Washington seems broken, this is a moment that calls for Los Angeles to lead, to be a model of moral leadership and of bold action. When others try to pull us apart, we pull together. And while others are obsessed with the most powerful, powerful person in this country, we are empowering the most vulnerable in our backyard. While paralysis and division embody politics in too many places, we do the hard work of building coalitions, planning for the future, and getting the job done. LA today is a vision of what America is reaching for tomorrow, what we've always yearned for, an inclusive society with an effective government. And there's nowhere I'd rather be, and no place I love more. This is our home, our paradise, as a close friend of mine says, but an imperfect paradise. And we all share the same heartbreaks, the same frustrations and pain. When you can't make it home in time to have dinner with your family because the freeway was too jammed. When we see our neighbors sleeping in tents under freeway overpasses. When our children are scared to go to school because they wonder if their parents will be deported while they're at math class. Too many people feel paralyzed by the challenges before them. I refuse to be paralyzed. In fact, every day I wake up more hopeful and more determined than the day before. Why? Because this is a place where people not only believe in a better future, we're creating it. And today I ask you to take that optimism, to tap into it, because this year our job is not simply to reflect the people's will, we're here to accelerate it. In the last year, we campaigned for historic investments, and we won. Now armed with the people of Los Angeles behind us and new resources to propel us, it is our time to deliver historic change, and we're starting on our streets. I remember a time growing up here when homelessness was mostly concentrated in Skid Row. Today, there are people without shelter in just about every neighborhood. As mayor, there is no issue I spend more time on because I believe that homelessness is the moral issue of our time. I'm outraged when there are Angelinos who can't escape the cold rain, horrified when somebody who has worn our nation's uniform is begging for change on the corner. I recently talked to a friend who told me that her children have grown up seeing the tents all around town, and they just think it's a normal part of Los Angeles. And I worry that my five-year-old daughter, she won't know any different either. We can't accept that. We won't accept that. And together, we have made significant progress. Since 2014, we've helped 24,000 men, women, and children find safe homes more than 9,000 in the last year alone. These are real people, real stories, real lives, and real results. But the problem persists. That's why we wrote Measure HHH. And thanks to this council and then the voters who passed it, we are going to more than triple 
our production of permanent supportive housing in the next two years. But we can't just build floors and walls. We have to rebuild lives. And that's why we fought so hard to pass Measure H with Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. So we could generate $355 million a year to expand mental health, substance abuse, and employment services across LA County, getting people off the streets, back on track, and into homes of their very own. And this morning, I'm proud to announce that the budget that I'm presenting to the City Council dedicates more than $176 million to house the unsheltered, connect them with services, and keep our communities safe and clean. You see, we are not here to address homelessness, or manage homelessness, or even reduce homelessness. We are here to end homelessness once and for all. But we all know that our housing crisis isn't limited to people living on our streets. In fact, anyone who writes a check at the beginning of the month knows that the rent in this city is just too high. Too many people are being priced out, even kicked out. More than 430,000 low-income families in Los Angeles are worried about keeping a roof over their head. They spend more than half of their income on rent, or they live in severely overcrowded, second-rate housing. Families like the Islam family know that struggle. Imli Islam works full-time as a teacher in Koreatown, preparing the next generation of Angelinos for success. Her husband, Nasrul, also works for LAUSD at an elementary school cafeteria in Silver Lake. They were raising their three children in a cramped one-bedroom apartment in the center of the city. Every morning, the family competed for the time in their family's only bathroom. For three years, Imli and Nasrul scoured the city for a better option, but came up empty-handed until they found Selma Community Housing, a project that the city helped fund in partnership with LAUSD, which I was proud to work on as council member. Steve Zimmer, Mitch O'Farrell and I were there when Selma opened up 66 affordable housing units in the heart of Hollywood last year. And the Islams are some of its newest tenants. Today, they can afford their rent. Their sons have their own rooms. And the family is enjoying a resurgent Hollywood that surrounds them instead of being priced out of it. But these stories are too rare. Too many still have to choose between making rent and making dinner. In the face of devastating federal and state cuts to affordable housing, it's our responsibility to help step up and create more of these success stories. Now, this is Los Angeles, so you better believe we're getting creative about how we build and preserve affordable housing in City Hall. We're letting more homeowners build in their own backyards to open up more affordable living spaces. We passed an historic policy to ensure that 35% of all housing on Metro-owned land will be affordable. We fought for, we fought for and we won our fair share of state cap and trade dollars to build hundreds of new units. We're making it easier to build by cutting red tape to put affordable housing projects at the front of the line. And last year, we strengthened our rent stabilization ordinance to protect Angelinos from illegal rent increases and evictions. I'm proud that we're more than halfway to my goal of building 100,000 new units of housing. But it's still not enough. I want a future where no one is crushed by the cost of rent. And that's why I'm calling on my friends on the City Council to pass the affordable housing linkage fee and do it now. <laughs> Council members have joined with me to support this because they know what this will mean for our city. The linkage fee that we have proposed before us will raise $100 million a year, leveraging another $300 million for affordable housing. Combined with HHH, it will allow us to more than double housing production, affordable housing production here in Los Angeles. 
I know, my friends, we can do this together. And we can drive down the price of housing in every district, in every neighborhood of our city. And when we do, we will preserve the quality of life in our communities. We will reduce traffic because people are closer to their jobs and their families. We will help the people who revitalize neighborhoods not get kicked out of those neighborhoods. But this isn't just the right thing to do for our people. It's the right thing to do for our economy. Businesses and unions understand that jobs need a place to sleep at night. People are moving here. That's the good news. We have more jobs today than at any time in our history because of our work. And we've helped over 186,000 new businesses open up over the last four years alone. But, but if we don't have affordable housing in Los Angeles, companies will find more affordable cities to bring those jobs to. Our city's future demands that we do this, and we're seeing the reasons unfold right before our eyes. We need to build more housing, but as a city, we also need a blueprint that reflects our future. We can't be passive when it comes to our aspirations, simply waiting for projects to be proposed or deciding what to build on a case-by-case -case basis. We need Angelinos to share their vision for their own neighborhoods and help imagine the Los Angeles of tomorrow. That's why it's so important to me that we reform how development gets done in LA. I'm gonna make sure that we update every single one of our 35 community plans in the next six years. And despite a nervous smile from Vince Bertoni, we're gonna have 10 finished plans in the books by the end of next year. We will accelerate our general plan update, that master document that shapes traffic and green space and housing so much more for our city. And these updates won't just be written by anonymous bureaucrats in back rooms. They will be written by and with the residents of Los Angeles in hundreds of public meetings and workshops so that the plans reflect the wishes of the people who live there. And as we open up that process to the people, we have to ensure that no doors are closed off to them either. That's why I banned all private conversations between developers and our city planning commissioners on the projects that they review. We must restore trust and transparency to a process that too many people see as insiders only. If we're gonna get ahead, we've gotta get moving. And that's what Measure M is all about. The largest transportation initiative in the history of the United States times two. I crisscrossed Los Angeles County campaigning for it. You supported it. Now it's time for us to deliver. And I want people to feel the impact of Measure M right away. I want you to see rail and bus service open sooner, a north-south line in the valley, a train that will go through the Sepulveda Pass, improvements to the Orange Line, a purple line that pushes to Westwood and beyond, rail that finally links to LAX, and upgraded transit up and down the Vermont corridor. But I also want you to see more streets being fixed. So my budget invests 35 million new dollars to fix our very worst streets. This means a smoother ride, fewer broken axles, and we are going to prioritize the most dangerous streets first so that we can save lives. This year, my budget will increase funding for Vision Zero from $3 million to nearly $17 million, including the launch of a public awareness campaign to get distracted drivers focused on the road. Fixing our roads and reducing traffic fatalities, they're not competing priorities. They must be one and the same. You deserve a safer, faster commute, and I'm gonna help deliver it. Whether it's an Expo Line extension, where we doubled peak hour trains, or our Blue Line, where we're investing more than a billion dollars to make that experience feel brand new, even though that line opened up 25 years ago. Our new public safety contract with Metro puts 150 of our very own LAPD officers on our trains, on our buses, and at metro stations, keeping riders safer and expanding officer patrols across our city day and night. And we're not gonna stop. 
because good transportation isn't just about infrastructure, it's about people. Is it easy to transfer? Are your, is your commute, uh, or sorry, are you comfortable during your commute? Can you get online? Did you make it to work on time? And that's why on July 1st, when I return as chair of the Metro Board, I'm going to start a committee to improve the rider experience. And Councilmember Mike Bonin will head it up. So if your bus is late, don't call me, please call Mike. <laughs> but I will be involved with him because Mike and Paul Krikorian and I and Jackie DuPont Walker, your representatives on the Metro Board, believe that going Metro shouldn't be a burden. It should be a convenience. These are big plans, Los Angeles. Plans that reflect our very best ideals and our highest aspirations. But in Los Angeles, we don't just plan for the best. We prepare for the worst. Two years ago, we together passed the most sweeping seismic retrofit legislation in all of America. Because imagine all of this work, all that we have built and love, gone in an instant, not on our watch. Our retrofits are well underway, and when the big one hits, they will save the lives and homes of a half million Angelinos. This year, we're going to build on that work. By the end of 2018, we will deploy an earthquake early warning system to every corner of this city, in schools, at businesses, even on your smartphone. It will give you a head start when an earthquake is coming, precious seconds that save lives. This same technology can help us stop trains in their tracks, bring elevators to a halt, even trigger backup generators so you don't get stuck in the dark. Now, earthquakes come quickly, but sometimes natural disasters don't happen in an instant. They come after decades of inaction. That's why in Los Angeles, we are leading the fight against climate change. We're not deterred by what we're hearing out of Washington. And let me be crystal clear. If the White House pulls out of the Paris Climate Accords, we're going to adopt them right here in Los Angeles. If the federal government skips off on its responsibilities, we'll be ready. I founded Climate Mayors, a coalition of 85 cities and growing, who will join us on taking on climate change locally and in doing so, take it on nationally. This new EPA may want to return to the days of coal and smog, but here in LA, we're going to make DWP coal free by 2025. Washington may not care about polluting rivers and streams, but we're going to continue cleaning our waterways and restoring our beautiful Los Angeles River to its natural habitat. In fact, Gil Cedillo and I were together when we bought the G2 parcel, and thank you to this council. 42 acres of new green space, which will help open up a river that over a quarter of LA's residents can walk to. And next week, we will reopen the Los Angeles State Historic Park along the land that first brought water to a thirsty Pueblo more than two centuries ago. DC may not think that environmental justice matters, but for us, it's a fundamental value. It's something that we fight for. We fought for the people of Boyle Heights, poisoned by a battery factory. We fought for the people of Porter Ranch, choked by a gas leak. And for the first time since the 1980s, we hired a petroleum administrator who will ensure that people living next to oil wells across the city, from University Park to Echo Park, from West Adams to Wilmington, will finally get some justice too. From cleaning up our communities to planning for the future, we're not just focused on LA's physical development, we're focused on human development too. We're building an economy that doesn't leave anyone behind, and we're supporting education that sets our young people up for good jobs, helps them think critically, and prepares them to change the world. We aren't going to be distracted by debates between adults because we're focused on kids. A young girl doesn't drop out of school because of tenure rules or what union her teachers are a part of. She drops out because of violence on her street or in her home, because of the poverty in her neighborhood, or because no one exposed her to engineering to spark her imagination, encouraged her to throw on a soccer journey, 
jersey or pick up a paintbrush. Because no one showed up at her door when she was just a few credits short of graduating because she had to work to support her family. And when that toxic brew boils over and that young girl gives up on school, she did not fail us. We failed her. If we want our students to succeed, we need to look at the whole picture. We need to bring all of our resources and ideas to bear. That's how we'll help students get their diplomas and move families into the middle class. A good education begins with ending poverty. That's why we fought to be the first city in the nation with two promise zones. Together, they're nearly the population of New Orleans. So when we make a difference there, it's on a massive scale. In central LA and south LA, they represent the promise of and the promise to our residents that the city of LA will be there to help you succeed. Since 2013, these promise zones and our promise neighborhoods, including the one in Pacoima, have helped secure $290 million in federal funding to combat poverty and improve education. We see the impact of those dollars in the life of Eileen Garcia and her one-year-old son, Nicholas. Eileen is a senior at the STEM Academy of Hollywood in one of our promise zones. When Eileen gave birth to Nicholas the summer before junior year, she was afraid she'd have to drop out. There was so much responsibility at home. She had a newborn baby. Her mother was undocumented and didn't speak English. Her father had walked out on the family a long time ago. And her younger sisters needed Eileen to be that second parent that they didn't have. But Eileen was also a regular at her high school's college center, which exists thanks to the Promise Zone. When she told our staff there that she wanted to get a degree, they helped make it happen. The Promise Zone helped her get a summer job, which helped her mom pay the rent. Our college center counselors helped her work on her college essays and get her applications in on time. Eileen, who's here with us, she put it best. I refuse to be a statistic. And guess what? Not only did Eileen stay in school, not only is she graduating, this fall, Eileen Garcia will be an incoming freshman at UCLA. Congratulations, Eileen. Congratulations, we are so proud of you. And while Eileen is exceptional, she isn't alone. At STEM Academy of Hollywood, we have raised graduation rates from 70% to 93% in just two years. Across our Promise Neighborhood high schools, 86% of students are now graduating in communities where 90% of the students are on free or reduced lunch. That's an all-time high. So don't tell me your zip code determines your future. In LA, we are proving every day that it doesn't have to. And our vision isn't just for Eileen, it's for her son, Nicholas, too. You see, when he starts school, Nicholas will automatically get a library card, just like every child in LAUSD. Thanks to my student success program, all students will have access to what lies behind our library doors, from homework help to STEM education. And we're going to make sure that Nicholas has access to after-school programs, like summer learning. We know that students who are involved in summer programs are 20% less likely to drop out because they don't spend July forgetting what they learned in March. Last year, the LA's best summer program served nearly 6,000 young Angelinos. This year, we're going to grow that number by 1,000. That's 1,000 more students who will receive the benefits of LA's best all summer long, improving their reading skills, exposing them to new ideas, and opening their eyes to the world around them. I've been an LA's best parent, and I know that these programs work. And when Nicholas gets a little bit older, we're going to be there again for him, this time to help him get a summer job. Since I became mayor, I'm proud that we have more than tripled the size of higher LA's youth, from 5,000 to 15,000 jobs. And by 2020, we're going to grow this program again to 20,000 jobs so that we can say to every young person in need, if you want a job, you've got a job. And when Nicholas graduates from high school, we'll be there to help him go after that college degree. One year ago, I vowed to make Los Angeles the largest city in America to offer one free 
year of community college to every LAUSD graduate. My friends from the Community College Board, a lot of people doubted that we could do it. But this fall, together with LAUSD, we will deliver on LA's college promise. And when that first class starts its freshman year, instead of a lifetime of debt, they'll be ready for a lifetime of success. And part of that lifetime of success is a good middle class job waiting for you when you graduate, a career as a police officer or an engineer or a gaffer. We aren't just chasing jobs that pay $15 an hour. We're going after jobs that pay $50 an hour and more and do it for a lifetime. That's why we're going to create a lasting pipeline to the middle class through Measure M with a program called Workforce Investment Now. Win LA will help generations of engineers and new construction workers raise their families on jobs that reduce traffic and shape LA's future. I'm talking about more than creating jobs. I'm talking about nurturing lifetime careers. That's also what we're going to do with Pledge to Patrol, a new initiative that we're announcing this morning to hire young Angelinos to work for the LAPD while they get their college degree. Thousands of young people in the city join cadet and other programs that help them prepare for a life of service in law enforcement. And when young people show an interest in joining our force, we don't want to lose them to other careers. So Pledge to Patrol builds a bridge from the classroom to the roll call room because we want to see more LAPD officers who grew up in the very same communities that they will serve. Good jobs also come from our legacy industries. That's why I led the campaign to pass our state's film tax credit, which has already brought 50,000 jobs and $2 billion in spending back home. Now, it's no surprise that people here want to bring their production. We have the best talent, we have the best weather, the best infrastructure in the world. It's one of the reasons that Netflix just announced that they're bringing $6 billion in production to Los Angeles at their new headquarters in Hollywood. They're going to invest in our creativity and in our workforce, filming America's strongest export right here. Hollywood is coming home, but the industry is also changing. Today, it's easier than ever for filmmakers to produce and distribute content. They work with smaller crews, less equipment, and they're able to produce more in one day than your traditional television and film shoots. But too many permits and too much bureaucracy threaten to chase that new production to other places. And I'm not about to let runaway production go digital. This morning, I am proud to announce that Los Angeles will be the first city in the nation to pilot a program that cuts permitting costs by up to two-thirds for small and web-based filmmakers, because we have to make sure that tomorrow's Hollywood stays here in Hollywood. Our economy is strong, but our future LA economy cannot be strong until it is strong for everybody. Three years ago, when I stood up the first Office of Veterans Affairs here in City Hall since World War II. I told LA's veterans that if you served our country, it was our turn to serve you, to connect you with housing and with jobs, and we launched the 10,000 Strong Veteran Jobs Initiative. By the end of this year, we will not only hit, we will exceed that number. And last year, we became the largest city in America to ban the box, so that a single check mark on a job application will no longer stop people from becoming contributing members to our society. You see, we are all better off when Angelinos who have paid their debt to society are met with opportunity. Angelinos like Patricia Allen. Years ago, desperate for money to support her child, Patricia committed a crime and served her time. A criminal record when she got out made finding work very difficult. But Patricia didn't give up trying, and this city didn't give up on her. Today, she's a union construction worker building the Crenshaw LAX rail line, just blocks from where she lives in South LA. And when her 15-year-old son, Jalen, stops by the work site, he sees his mom motivated and working hard to make this city and their family's life even better. This year, Los Angeles is on track to link 1,000 formerly incarcerated Angelinos like Patricia to jobs. 
because 70% of people who work, sorry, who walk out of jail are unemployed. More than half of them are reincarcerated. But if they land a job, those odds plummet to less than 10%. We are safer and our economy is stronger when we stop that revolving door that sends people from the streets to the prison cells and back again. <laughs> My friends, this is our shared work of making sure that Los Angeles is a more prosperous, safer, and cleaner city. Since the recession, we have restored core services that were gutted, put more cops on the streets to combat crime, and made City Hall more responsive and transparent. In the last four years, we've made unprecedented progress. The budget I'm presenting to City Council today is not only balanced, it preserves those critical investments and pushes them further. For the third year running, we'll repair and repave a record number of streets. We're going to spend $31 million to fix cracked sidewalks more than ever before. And we're going to get graffiti off our walls. During my time as council, on the council, my UNTAG program helped me cut in my district graffiti by over 80%. And the main reason for that success? We got that paint off the walls fast. That's why I'm funding in this budget a program to clear 90% of graffiti requests in a day. And we aren't just cleaning up graffiti, we're going to clean up the streets as well. Since 2013, we've added 2,500 new trash cans to the streets of LA. This year, we'll add another 1,250. But this budget also includes people, new teams to clean every one of our dirtiest streets. Thanks to our nationally recognized Clean Streets program, we now know the cleanliness of each of the 7,300 miles of LA's public streets and alleyways. That means we can target our resources to the right blocks. And each resident can hold us accountable. This budget funds another important priority, more humane animal shelters. Because Los Angeles is a city that cares. I see this when I go to our animal shelters, where a family is adopting a kitten, or a little boy is meeting his new best friend. Today, I am so proud to announce that in 2017, Los Angeles will become the largest no-kill city in the nation. And Councilmember Kretz will be there to hold your kitty. <laughs> Quality of life also depends on the safety of our neighborhoods. Thanks to the incredible work of our police officers and our public safety professionals and intervention workers, I am proud to say that crime has leveled off since last summer. And all violent crime this year is again going in the right direction, down. It's down 4% this year. Homicides alone down 8%. But we have to keep pushing. And that starts with getting more guns off the streets and putting more cops on them. This past weekend, a three-year-old girl was a victim of a shooting. A three-year-old girl. She was in my office yesterday, and I saw where a bullet hit her in the neck and passed through her without hitting an artery. That's a miracle. But we can't rely on miracles when our children's lives are at stake. After hearing about this shooting, I held my own daughter a little longer and a little more tightly the next morning when I woke her up. I'm sure a lot of parents in this city did. But no matter how hard we try to protect our children, this kind of irrational violence is still happening. And we cannot tolerate it. We will not tolerate it. We need guns off our streets, and we need them gone now. And that's why I've set a new goal to rid our communities of 20,000 guns in the next five years. <laughs> Working together with our city attorney and our council leaders who have committed themselves to this work, we'll expand our successful gun buyback program, but we'll also create for the first time a crime gun intelligence center to coordinate local and federal resources in communities that are hardest hit by violence. 
And we also know we need more officers out on the beat. My budget this past year brought more than 300 civilians into the LAPD so that we could get more officers out from behind desks and into our communities. Keeping our neighborhoods safe also means investing in programs that work, which is why I invested, sorry, I expanded our gang reduction and youth development work to more, than, to more neighborhoods and added prevention and intervention workers to every one of the 23 grid zones across our city. A new study shows that this approach works. Grid workers prevented 185 gang-related violent crimes, including homicides, in two years. Because of their commitment and their dedication, there are literally men and women on the streets of this city graduating from high school and college who would not be there, tucking a child into bed, volunteering in their communities, Angelinos who otherwise wouldn't be with us today. It's another reason that we're going to be growing our community safety partnership. Marquise Harris Dawson and I were there to announce a few weeks ago that this national model that works so well in CD15 and other places keeps police officers in the same place for five years. Because it makes a difference when young people in the neighborhood know the names of the cops that are on their streets. And then those cops become coaches and get involved with local organizations and churches. Because when we build trust between our police department and our people, everyone feels safer especially immigrant Angelinos, who might be feeling pretty anxious right now. And that's why I want you all to hear once again loud and clear that LAPD will never act as a federal immigration force. Neither, neither will our airport or port police or our firefighters, because keeping our city safe means not making victims or witnesses afraid to report a crime. Ustedes pueden confiar en los oficiales de la policía de Los Ángeles. Ellos están aquí para servirle. No tengan miedo de denunciar un crimen. Los oficiales del LAPD no les entregarán a las autoridades federales de inmigración. We want people in this city to earn legal wages, pay taxes, and start businesses, not be pushed into the shadows. That's why here in Los Angeles, every city facility, service, and program is available to every resident, regardless of their citizenship or immigration status. That's why I helped launch the $10 million LA Justice Fund, because no dreamer or family that dreams should face that kind of threat without someone in their corner. Not in Los Angeles. Not as long as we are here. And I know Angelinos agree with me. I saw that spirit in the people who rushed to LAX to fight for immigrants and refugees earlier this year. People like Talia and Linda, an immigration attorney who spent the entire weekend volunteering at LAX. The days out there were long and hard, but thousands of people turned out at the airport to bring food and water to the volunteers, to march through the terminals holding signs that read, let them in and you are welcome here. For Talia, whose own grandparents fled Poland, whose father was born in a refugee camp in Austria. It was a heartbreaking but inspiring weekend. She talked to so many worried families, worked to get a young woman with a student visa off a plane stuck on the runway, and she saw the power in Angelinos unified around a common cause. Talia said she never felt so ashamed of Washington, but so proud of Los Angeles. Thank you, Talia. You see, Talia and Patricia and Eileen and the Islam family, they're the face of Los Angeles. Sure, we have movie stars and aerospace engineers. I'm proud of it. But most Angelinos are teachers 
and factory workers, firefighters and nurses, everyday people helping our families and our communities get better each day. I reject the idea that here in Los Angeles, we live in some isolated world on the coast because I know our families struggle with the same things that people grapple with throughout the country. But caring for each other and then doing something about it, that's the heart and soul of Los Angeles. That's what sets us apart. Because in this city, we don't fight with each other, we fight for each other. And that spirit, it doesn't come from City Hall. It may be reflected here, but only because it comes from all of you. A spirit that for generations has led Angelinos to shatter barriers that no one even knew existed. A spirit that led us to look beyond the sky and up to the heavens because we saw a new frontier. A spirit that harnessed nature itself to build this land a spirit of generosity and compassion proven by small acts of kindness every day. A spirit reflected in people like Angel Espinosa, an outreach worker with Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Angel was once homeless himself. And after years on the street, Angel decided to get treatment for his drug addiction and ended up at the New Image Shelter where he was connected to housing. Today, he's a single father raising two sons, Elijah and Joshua. And when people ask his boys what their father does for a living, they say simply, he saves lives. Too often, homeless Angelinos tell me that they, they feel invisible, that people start to look past them until they're not even there. But not Angel. Angel sees everybody. I've done outreach with him a few times now along our rivers and overpasses where we meet with our fellow Angelinos. And his approach is always the same. He crouches down to the ground to look folks right in the eye and to ask them softly how we can help. They don't always accept his help right away. He knows, and I've learned, that doing good takes time, persistence, trust. It takes love. He is an angel in this city of angels. A reminder of the work that we should be all proud to be a part of every day. For four years, I have been so honored to be your mayor. For four years, I have been honored to help lead our collective spirit in this city, to help lead our common aspirations, four million strong. And most of all, I have been honored to serve all of you. Because the state of our city is only as strong as the person who needs us most. And each morning, every day that I serve as your mayor, I wake up with this in mind. That we are here to lift up those who feel most vulnerable. That we are here to make life a little bit easier for those raising families. That we are here in this place where our mountains meet our sea, to do the good that people like Angel teach us every day, to lead with love and patience and persistence and trust, and to do it together. So that next spring when we gather, we can report that the state of our city is even stronger and it is stronger for everyone. God bless you and God bless this city of angels Thank you all so much.
I'm Shannon Lamert Park. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35, Our City, Our Channel. Hello everyone, welcome to LA Roundtable on LA City View 35. I'm Dave Bryan, the host of the Roundtable and political reporter at CBS2 and KCAL 9 TV. The topic on this Roundtable is let's get it right, guilty or innocent. We're talking about cases where an innocent person was convicted of a crime and in many cases sent to prison, sometimes for several years before justice was finally done and the conviction was reversed. We've got a great panel to talk about this issue, these cases, what's being, why they sometimes happen, and what can be done to fix things. First of all, Michael Schwartz is a special assistant district attorney in the Ventura County D DA's office. He's prosecuted many cases of all types and has done research and preparation for capital murder cases. He's also the conviction integrity deputy with the Ventura County DA's office, and we'll talk to him in a, in a minute about what that means. Alex Simpson is the legal director of the California Innocence Project, which is based at California Western School of Law in San Diego. We want to thank you for joining us and thanking Michael as well. And Dan Simon, a professor of law and psychology at USC and the author of In Doubt, The Psychology of the Criminal Justice System. He's done a great deal of research on why innocent people are sometimes convicted of crimes they didn't commit. So what I want to do to get things started is I want to, I want to have each one of you talk about what is the issue here in terms of getting these cases right? What is the issue? Or what is the problem? And what is your connection to the issue? And Dan, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks very much for having this panel. It's a vital issue. Um, what I think is important to understand is that the criminal justice process is, is driven to a large degree by human inputs. It's um, witnesses and detectives and, and lawyers and judges and jurors all contributing something to the process. And that something is basically um, some form of cognitive input. It's a memory, it's a judgment, it's an inference, it's a, de it's a decision. And um, the experimental psychology suggests that people don't do all of these things perfectly. And they certainly don't do them perfectly in contexts which are really um, burdensome and onerous and complicated. And investigating and adjudicating, adjudicating criminal cases can be really difficult. 
So uh, my work really looks at what might be the causes, the psychological uh, underpinnings of when people get things right and when people get things wrong. And, and the overall sense from the literature is that um, we have a, a, an appreciable rate of error in the evidence that we produce to trial. And I would very much like to see the criminal justice system come to terms with that and adopt better procedures uh, to actually uh, minimize these risks. Alex? Well, I, think, I absolutely think that that's correct. I think the issue is that we have a criminal justice system that uh, is not perfect, and it's uh, completely fallible at a number of different levels, uh, both in terms of the investigation of a particular case, to the prosecution, to the defense of a particular case. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that I do as the legal director of the California Innocence Project is I look through cases uh, to find out whether or not there was some problem with the case originally. So even if you don't look at uh, some of the new advances through, say, for example, DNA, there are a lot of cases that have uh, uh, human input and human error that are kind of built into the system. And so, uh, you know, in terms of the issue, I think that what we're trying to do is unpack some of those problems and, uh, and at least acknowledge that uh, when we're talking about a criminal prosecution, uh, just because a jury comes back and says that the person's guilty, that doesn't necessarily mean that the person may have done it. Michael, you're the prosecutor here. I suspect you have a slightly different point of view, maybe. Not really. I, our job is to convict the guilty and exonerate the innocent. The Supreme Court has said that we have a dual duty, that the guilty shall not escape and the innocent shall not suffer. And our job is to try and get it right. I think in the vast number of cases, we do get it right. But it would be naive to say that the system is perfect. And we, we know that it isn't. We've all read stories from Texas and other places around the country where someone has served sometimes decades in prison and then has been exonerated by DNA evidence where it is proved conclusively that they didn't do it. So that's an important reminder to us that as prosecutors that, that, it is, that the system is not perfect and that we need to do as much as we can to try and get it right. The idea that someone would serve a, a prison sentence for a crime they didn't commit is a terrible tragedy. And I mean, not only for that person, but for society. Mm -hmm. While they're sitting in prison, the real criminal may be out and may be killing or, or raping other people. So it, it's a bad deal all the way around. Now, you're, you're the conviction integrity deputy, which is a somewhat unique position, at least here in Southern California. So what exactly do you do then with regard to these cases? What, 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 what is your connection? When we get a claim from a defense attorney or a defendant on a completed case that they are factually innocent, we will review the claim and determine whether there is any merit to it. It may, in some cases, it may be something that can be done fairly quickly. <clears throat> Other times we may have to go out and interview witnesses, uh, review all the transcripts, and determine whether there is a possibility that the person is actually innocent. I don't mean to be cynical, but doesn't everyone say they're innocent even after they're convicted? I mean, are no. you reviewing all the cases? No. Or? I, when we first announced the program, I was concerned that we would get a, a flood of, of claims. Uh, we started the program late last year, and we received uh, six requests during that hmm. period. Um, so, and, and there are many defendants who admit they're guilty. Many plead guilty. Um, so it's not everybody. And of the six that you've gotten, have any of them, have you proceeded with any of them or have they all been rejected? I mean, what, what's the outcome? So far, we've only completed two of them and we rejected both of those. I got you. But we're looking at all of them with an open mind. So when we talk about innocent people being convicted and going to jail, I mean, what percentage of, of all the cases is this? Is it, you, you, you said, uh, Dan, that it's too high. What, what is too high? What does that mean? What is the percentage? You know, um, we will never know what the percentage is, and we certainly don't know that number now. Um, the, the data are just way too murky, and we've got too little, uh, too few indicia of actual guilt and actual innocence to determine that number. The best estimates that are out there uh, put it at somewhere in the range of 2 to 5 percent of the cases. Um, and I think it's important to remember that, at, as Mr. Schwartz said, the, you know, the vast majority of people sitting in prison are actually guilty. So this, uh, nobody is out to condemn the system wholesale. The question is, uh, how much do we care about those people who, you know, where we miss, uh, who are put in, um, uh, you know, despite their innocence? 
And um, whether it's two or whether it's five, I think the, the, the point should really be one of uh, what, as a society, what we should do is try to minimize that number, and not at all costs, but at all reasonable costs, and actually really put a serious effort into it. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that we're at a better time today than we were 10 years ago. And the kind of consensus that you're hearing around this panel is a good testament that, that we're on our way to there. Um, I would just say that though uh, there's, you know, DNA exonerations are very dramatic, as mm -hmm. they should be probably, um, that's not the solution. Uh, we have DNA evidence in too few cases. And anyway, we don't want to wait 5, 10, 20, sometimes 30 years to, to try to correct a wrong that was done. We should be much more uh, focused on preventing these things up front. And, and there are actually uh, fairly good protocols that are based on science um, and, and on common sense, by the way, uh, that we could actually do to change the process up front and just prevent these errors. Um, that's the way to go, so, really. So to prevent them, Alex, you have to know why they're occurring in the first place. So why do these kinds of cases occur? I mean, what's, what are the most common causes of a conviction that, that's wrong? You know, there, uh, I, I'd, I'd hate to say that there's a particular bread and butter type case that we see in the California Innocence Project. Uh, um, I think some of the, the things that we see uh, fairly often um, are cases of uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. Uh, here in LA, you know, we have uh, uh, hundreds of people who go through the system every single day, and every single one of them uh, has a lawyer, but that lawyer may have uh, 100 or even 200 cases uh, on their docket. Um, and so that invites uh, error, that invites uh, an inability to look through uh, every single case with a fine tooth comb. Uh, but there are other things that, uh, uh, in terms of nationwide, what we've seen in the innocence movement is uh, cases such as uh, eyewitness identification, which uh, there's a number of studies that show that what we originally thought uh, was uh, so powerful and so uh, convincing, even though it may be very convincing, it's not necessarily very accurate. Mm -hmm. Eyewitness identification is, is uh, a very powerful tool in the... Uh, in the courtroom, but it's not necessarily the best, most reliable evidence. Um, other issues have to do with uh, false admissions or false confessions. Uh, there are some situations where uh, bad uh, science is introduced against an in individual. Uh, so any particular case may have a combination of those factors uh, or some different factor altogether. Well, we're going to uh, to run a, a piece now. This is a report that was done on, on KCAL 9 uh, in May of, of last year, about a year ago, uh, about a rape case involving a man uh, named Brian Banks. And this is the news report that, that ran uh, about uh, how that conviction was overturned. I hope we can see it in the studio here, because I'm going to ask you to talk about it afterwards. So let's go ahead and roll that and take a look at the story. A former Long Beach High School football star starting a new life tonight as a free man. After years in prison, Brian Banks was set free after his accuser admitted she falsely accused him of rape. KCAL 9 Stacey Butler is live in Long Beach with Banks' emotional story. Stacey? Rick, as Brian Banks sat in a jail cell for five years, he was consumed with one thought, his freedom. Today, in a gut-wrenching day in court, he got it. My only dream in the world was to just be free. Brian Banks has dreamed of this day for 10 years. Uh, the people will concede the matter, Your Honor, and ask the court to grant the petition. Right. Petition is granted. Exonerated of a rape he never committed. A decade ago, Brian Banks was a star football player at Long Beach Polytechnic High School. Heavily recruited by colleges, he had a full scholarship to USC. A career in the NFL was inevitable. But that all changed when Winetta Gibson, also a student, accused him of kidnapping and raping her in 2002. Banks' attorney advised him to plead no contest. He was convicted. It wasn't a choice that I made. I didn't choose to plead uh, guilty. I didn't choose to plead no contest. I was forced into it. It was a decision that I was proposed with, and I had 10 minutes to make that decision without even being able to consult my parents. Banks spent five years in prison. At that age, you expect your attorney to be the person that you can depend on and count on to make those, you know, give you those, that, the right advice and decisions to make. 
And so I took the plea. For the last five years, he hasn't once removed his ankle bracelet, a requirement for the rising.